Hello. How are you guys doing? <laughs> Happy post-election day. How you doing, Amir? Doing well, thank you, John. Um, I've got my uh, vintage Obama t-shirt on from 2008, <laughs> representing there. Um, so uh, who are we waiting for right now? Just Ted? Okay. One second, let me just check on him. All right, um, Ted is uh, just uh, getting started. Um, so he's just starting up his, uh, he's having some technical difficulties there. So um, why don't we get started? Um, so hello, everybody. Um, I'm Amir Irani. I'm the chair of ANC1C, and I also represent uh, single member district 1C01, which is the southwest corner of Adams Morgan. Uh, I'd like my fellow commissioners to um, introduce themselves, starting uh, with 1C08, Commissioner Jackson. Hi, I'm Chris Jackson, representing 1C08, the uh, southeastern corner of ADMO. Hello everyone, my name is Jay Bowles and I represent 1C07, which is the western side of the Reed Cook Neighborhood Association, or as more people know, uh, the eastern portion of 18th Street. Damiana? Yeah, hi, I'm Damiana. I'm representing 1C05, which is the northernmost district. And hi, uh, John Zotoli, uh, 1C04 which is the area that includes Walter Pierce Park, right behind me where it's always spring. <laughs> um, well, thank you. Um, so uh, let's go on to officer's reports. Um, I'll start uh, by saying that there is going to be a new uh, Capitol Bike Sheriff Station installed um, road at about 20th in Columbia, uh, across from 1930 Columbia Road uh, at a triangle park there. And that's going to bring 19 new uh, capital uh, bike share docks. Uh, uh, two of those uh, parking spots will be um, Re, two parking spots across the street from the bike share station will be redesignated as resident only parking. So there's a net loss of one uh, resident parking spot uh, in order to have 19 bikes there. Um, and the other thing uh, I'd like to announce is that leaf collections, in case anyone is wondering about that, I received quite a few emails of that. Um, there was a uh, talk about uh, 20 paper bags being distributed uh, to each household, but that's no longer the case. You don't need to bag your leaves. Uh, leaf collections will occur twice in each neighborhood. 
uh, starting on November 9th and you just put them um, just as you would end of year, crews will go around and vacuum them up. Uh, so that's all I have for the chair announcements. Uh, going on to the um, other commissioners, starting with Commissioner Bowles, 1C08. Yeah, uh, thanks so much. Um, so I just want to thank everyone for voting. Um, I know that it was a really uh, exciting time for everyone. So um, it looks, uh, I'm feeling a little, uh, I'm resting easy now. So uh, I hope everyone else is in regards to the national election. Um, so thank everyone else who ran and uh, for the current commissioners. Uh, thanks so much for all that you've done. And I look forward to continuing to work with everyone here. So um, I really wanted to kind of keep it short because we have a lot on the agenda. Um, I have a treasurer's report that I could go and do now. I can read through the transactions. Yes, you said yes. Please, please, please do. Yeah. Okay, cool. So um, let me share. Okay, so we have a quarterly financial report that we pass every uh, three months. Um, let me pull this up. This is the last from the last fiscal year. Uh, we are in the 21 fiscal year now. Sorry, I'm having difficulties finding screen share. Okay. All right, does everyone see my screen? Yes. Okay, great. Okay, so um, this is the summary of the report. Um, it is a rather large expense in personnel as well as grants. We had one grant that we went out that was the Reed Cook Neighborhood Association. Um, so to further specialize, um, specify what those personal service or personnel costs were, um, it's essentially uh, Mary Coogan here um, and then Ken Waters, who does our accounting work. Um, again, Mary, and then additional um, benefits that we pay the government. And then um, another in, uh, way we categorize, which we have categorized differently in this ne next fiscal year, is Gordon Chafin's um, uh, cost for the virtual production. So um, next year's budget, we have also categorized Gordon Chafin, or we have budgeted for Gordon Chafin, but the category is uh, professional services. Um, that makes more sense to us. So um, does anyone have any questions? We did get a few interest payments. Um, in our current budget, we had um, three district allotments come in um, basically within a week. Um, so if you could, uh, I can give me one moment and I can find out what the, uh, how much money we have in the bank. Um, but if, you, if there's any questions here, um, I can grab that number real quick. So, uh, um, uh, contract from number one personnel to number seven purchase of service. Is that right? For the coming year, okay. Yes, uh, Guthrie, go ahead. Yeah, I, I assume that the two different payments to the accountant were because there were two different billing cycles that just got paid this time. And I, I just wanted to um, reaffirm what Gottlieb had sent to you, Japer, about the the uh, substantial question as to whether we're supposed to be paying the federal. Um, amounts and and that I'm somewhat disturbed that our accountant would not have known that and I think that the commission should seriously consider accounting services that would adequately do the job and some sort of restitution either from the feds or from um, the accountant who sounds like it's screwed up yeah uh, so we're I hope that someone goes forward on that yeah, so we're definitely moving forward with that um, in terms of getting, hopefully getting restitution from the government. Um, 
I have quite a few suggestions of how to make this role better. And one would definitely be looking at who we're getting our accounting um, stuff from. I think that makes sense. Um, so, uh, I mean, I just don't know who originally found our current services. And, um, you know, I, 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 it goes back at least 10 years. Yeah, so yeah, a thorough vetting of that, I think would probably do us some real good. In addition to um, a big change, there's a, a few things that I think that we need to do um, just to make us uh, function better financially. But um, yeah, we are definitely on that. I'm glad that the Office of ANC found that um, because that's why we have an accountant. I would have not have known that either, <laughs> so. Um, but yeah, thank you. Um, and okay. Any other questions? Hey, Japer, it probably doesn't um, matter. Sorry, Amir, but, uh, the, my name is spelled incorrectly. It's G O R D O N. Thank you. It always matters, Gordon. But I, uh, yeah, I can update the transaction report. And questions from members of the public. Uh, please raise your hand if you're on Zoom or pr uh, press star nine if you're dialing in. I'll give that a moment. Um, hearing none, um, I move that uh, we adopt the budget as uh, described and shown. Um, I second the motion. Thank you. All those in favor, please indicate so by saying aye. 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 Any against? Any abstentions? Passes. Unanimous. And then the only other thing is that unless on further until there's a unless there's further notice, uh, I don't believe we'll be having a PS and E meeting uh, this month as it falls in the week of Thanksgiving. So um, if anyone wants to do a joint one beforehand or one after, um, let me know. I'm glad to uh, help elevate that if there's any concerns that relate to PS and E matters. Okay. Okay. Um, thank you. Um, I'll also uh, uh, make it now that we're the chair's report. Commissioner Jackson, Secretary Jackson. Uh, we've got a lot on the agenda tonight. Uh, we've got the approving the quarterly financial reports, as we just talked about. Um, we've got DDOT is doing a presentation on the 16th Street bus lane project. Uh, approving the fiscal 2020 ANC annual report, possible considerations of two off-premises liquor licenses for Harris Teeter and Argonne Market, uh, possible consideration of a settlement again with Taki Ta Takira Aledo. There's a discussion about Unity Park issues, considering a request for zoning relief at 1630 Columbia Road, provide for ground floor dining cafe space, Consideration of sending a letter of support for AMP bid for the holiday display. Consideration of a letter of support for traffic safety assess assessment questionnaire for Ontario Road. Consideration of resolution on slow streets. Consideration of resolution requesting that DDOT respond to repeated requests of Adams Morgan's residents. Consideration of traffic safety assessment requested by RCNA. Discussion, discussion of the Connecticut Ave, Avenue Dackover project and consideration of a resolution authorizing the chair to write a letter against the public space application at 2018th Street Northwest, requesting exception to District of Columbia Municipal Re Regulations regarding public space and fencing, uh, grant application for Jubilee Jumpstart, a resolution in support of ranked choice voting, and a letter to DGS in support of public restroom facilities in Adams Morgan. Boy, that is a mouthful. Um, yeah. Can we throw any of that on the consent agenda? <laughs> um, okay. Um, 
So, uh, and uh, commissioner announcements, committee meeting agendas. Let's start with, uh, um, we'll start over on my end actually, one C zero one. So we do have uh, a couple of items on the PZT agenda for the coming month. Um, uh, I don't have other announcements, but those items for the PZT agenda are a resolution to um, decriminalize street vending. Um, and we will also consider uh, the proposed renovations at the Festival Center uh, over on Columbia Road. Um, so those are the two items right now for PZT uh, this month. And PZT meeting, uh, while well, you'll be able to find the details, the access details, meeting details online at anc1c.org, uh, but the actual meeting will take place on November 18th at 7 p.m. virtually. So uh, moving on for me, Commissioner Guthrie, um, announcements? Yeah, I'm, I'm not aware of any agenda items for the ABC Public Safety Commission um, meeting, so I would propose that uh, the meeting itself not be held. Um, and if Japer needs, um, needs to have a committee meeting, he can insert it into our slot. Okay, okay. Did you, did you have any agenda items, Japer? I assume you didn't. I mentioned that uh, they may not have a meeting this month. Yeah, yeah, so it, it sounds like we can have next week off. Um, no announcements other than that. Okay. Oh, except, except uh, that um, I didn't hear on the agenda um, the issue for public space for Taqueria Alato, did that get included, Chris? Well, uh, yeah, I believe so. I well, just mispronounced it, I believe. Um, well, that we have a settlement agreement that we're going to be considering, but there's also a public space issue. Yeah, we can, add, we'll add that at the end of the PZT. We'll need okay. a preliminary motion. Yeah. Right. Okay. Um, and uh, Commissioner Zatoli? Well, the news from 1C04 is that in January, we're getting a new commissioner. Um, last night, I congratulated Megan Faulkner on her election. Uh, she's gonna be a great commissioner and welcome, Megan. Thank you, Joan. Um, and uh, Damiana, do you have uh, announcements? Uh, just same, similar announcement, new commissioner for January. So that's very exciting news. Great. Um, okay. So um, why don't we move on to uh, public announcements? So Kristen, go right ahead. Great. Um, thank you. Uh, I wanted to just... Um, do a couple of, of shout outs and thank yous and then let folks know about uh, some of our upcoming events. So first of all, um, the Apple Festival um, was last Saturday. It was a big success. Um, the weather was a little chilly, but it was sunny. So um, people came out and bought um, apple pie. So we raised about $1,100 for the RCNA COVID relief fund. And um, uh, Japer and Nick and um, Fiona were a big help. So, um, you know, thank you all for um, pitching in and helping us cut apple pie because <laughs> it got done much faster with your help. Um, and um, we announced in our newsletter the winners for best crust, best filling, best appearance, and best overall. Um, and each one of them will receive a two week CSA from Licking Creek Bend Farm. Um, that's the community supported agriculture. Um, they'll get a two week membership. Um, so um, it, was, it was not quite the same Apple Festival that we've done in previous years, but it was um, you know, a COVID Apple Festival. And I think it went pretty well given, the, uh, given all the changes. Um, some of you have probably been able to catch the ad mobile. Um, it's um, uh, uh, music on the move. Um, Joe Lappin from Songbird bought this really cool vintage Chevy truck and so on Saturday afternoons, between about five and seven, um, we've, he's been driving it around the neighborhood um, with bands playing in the back um, and stopping periodically. So um, look for the truck again this Saturday. We're gonna try to do it 
um, this Saturday and possibly next Saturday if the weather holds out. Um, and then after that, we'll probably take a break until the spring. Um, but it's been a lot of fun. It's not quite the same as Porch Fest, um, but uh, um, you know, we're trying to spread, spread the love of music um, uh, throughout the neighborhood. Um, and you've probably seen a few businesses have boarded up um, in anticipation of, of potential um, issues related to uh, the election. Fortunately, um, there wasn't any physical damage that we know of last night. Um, however, between now and inauguration, I think everybody's kind of on alert. Um, and so you may see those boards stay up for a bit. Um, some might decide to take them down, some might put up more boards. So um, we'll just have to kind of wait and see. Um, but don't be surprised if you see, you know, um, some businesses doing that as, as a precaution. So, um, and they will, will usually put up signage to indicate that they are indeed still open. Um, so um, the holidays are right around the corner. Um, as you know, we're going to be doing um, those interactive gift boxes um, in bb and Bank Plaza, and we appreciate the ANC's um, support of that. Um, we're also going to be putting some garland on streetlights um, around the neighborhood, and um, we're encouraging business owners to also decorate their front windows, um, even with just something simple. Um, we're trying to spread the spread the holiday cheer. Um, we're going to host a, a lighting ceremony on Friday, November 20th um, from five to seven. Um, and we'll have carolers and some um, hot chocolate, hot apple cider um, in the plaza when we turn on the, the lights for the um, gift boxes. So please join us on Friday, November 20th. Um, that will be kind of a kickoff to the holiday season, we hope. Um, and I'm trying to think if there's anything else. Um, I think that's it from us for right now. So i um, happy to answer any questions. Thanks, Kristen. Um, plenty of good things going on. Love the apple pie uh, festival and this year, the COVID relief fund at RCNA. So that was awesome. Um, Nick, uh, go right ahead. Thank the bid and Licking Creek Bend Farm. Although Kristen said they raised $1,100 for the relief fund, and we're very, very great. Um, and then secondly, I uh, just want to announce last month, RCNA held our board elections at our, our October meeting. Um, and I'm going to post all their names in the chat rather than list them out in the essence of time. So now there's a lot on the agenda. So that's all for me. I'm going to post. Thanks, Nick. So members, thank you. Okay. Um, why don't we keep going here? Uh, so uh, DDOT uh, is... The team from DDOT is here to discuss the 16th Street bus. Um, they'll provide an update on the pro uh, Just saw your hand. Go right. Sorry, can you all hear me? Yeah, we yes, sure we can. can. Okay, great. It's a little, not a, I don't think I have a great connection. So let me know if it, if it uh, cuts out or anything. Um, my name is Ali Bobak. I'm the constituent services coordinator for council member Nadeau, who's your ward one council member. If anybody needs constituent services, my direct number is 202-531-5186. And my email is abobak at dccouncil.us. Um, I also, if I can post in the chat, I will post the council member's latest newsletter. There are quite a few updates coming from the council, but I know you all have a very busy agenda tonight. Um, just kind of the freshest news is that today Councilmember Nadeau shared a letter explaining where she stands on school reopening. So if anybody is interested in that, they can find that on Twitter and I can post it as well. Um, she also had a hearing today on the uh, of since she chairs the Committee on Human Services, she held a roundtable for public comment on human services agencies and their response to COVID. So the first was today, and you can find the recording on the DC Council website. The next one is this Friday at 10 a.m., where she will be 
hearing testimony about DHS, the Interagency Council on Homelessness and Child and Family Services Agency. And the last one, and then again, I'll send all the other updates through the chat if possible, is that we're having a comprehensive plan Ward 1 open house that is going to be Monday, November 16th at 6.30 p.m. And it's basically just gonna be an open house to discuss how Ward 1 can benefit from amendments to the comprehensive plan and also hear feedback from constituents. So again, uh, I can send this, these all these things to the commissioners and or post them. My name is Ali Boback, 202-531-5186 and aboback at dccouncil.us. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ali. Um, so uh, is there a team from DDOT here to discuss the 16th Street uh, bus lane project? One, well, let's, uh, well, why don't we just keep going? We have quite an agenda, so that could be a blessing in disguise. Um, maybe we can, uh, I'll send them a note to see what happened there. Um, so moving to the consent agenda, uh, we have the October meeting minutes and the uh, FY 2020 annual report um, on the agenda. The annual report just summarizes the actions taken by our commission. Uh, that includes uh, all the resolutions we've passed, uh, grants, um, and any other action that uh, we've taken, all summarized in one annual report. You can find that online. Um, we did, this is per the uh, new uh, legislation passed uh, last year. So this is the second year we're providing an annual report. Um, so, uh, there's no objections. I'll move that we adopt the consent agenda uh, as they are, uh, the two items as they are. All those in favor, please indicate so by saying aye. 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 Any against? Any abstentions? All right. And um, now moving to um, our regular agenda. Uh, let's start with um, the uh, ABC and public safety. Commissioner Guthrie, you wanna take that? Yeah, I wasn't clear whether we had the 10 day notice um, satisfied for the Al for the Taqueria Al Lado um, settlement agreement. Does anyone know? We can do a preliminary motion if that's necessary. Um, Hmm. Why don't I, we do thought it? That it, I thought it, that it got noticed like immediately after our ABC meeting, but I'm not sure of that. Um, let's, assume that let's assume that it's fine um, because I, I remember putting that in the notes for the ABC meeting. Um, we came to a settlement agreement that um, I, I believe Mary got posted online with Taqueria Alato. It's owned by the same folks who operate um, Alvolo next door and uh, Retro Bodega that's on 18th Street. And we've had a, a long and uh, uh, productive interaction with the owner of those three establishments. We've seen how they operate through the years. We uh, used um, as a template, the Retro Bodega settlement agreement. Um, but reflecting the, the differences between the operations. For example, there's no entertainment endorsement that was applied for for the Taqueria um, as opposed to the Retro Bodega. Um, and they have a, an unusual situation where they have no access to the um, alley from the back of the building. Um, instead, there is this wonderful little courtyard that they're going to be um, using for um, guests that's particularly helpful during this time of COVID. Uh, there's also an issue that was of some concern to the neighborhood about the public space application and in discussions with the owner, um, the application that got put into public space was erroneous. It didn't give the proper layout. What they're planning to do is have a ledge 
that faces toward the establishment with um, seating that it'd be sort of like a bar space, basically. So there wouldn't be separate tables that and two tops in front that would interfere more with the uh, pedestrian traffic that tends to be pretty heavy in that part of the neighborhood. Uh, so we'll be taking that up at the uh, end of the PZT agenda as a special matter. But at this point, I'd like to move that the ANC1C approve the settlement agreement that has been entered into with ANC1C, KCA, and the applicant um, for the license, and that we also approve their application for a stipulated license that would allow them to begin serving before the protest period ends. Currently, the protest periods have been extended so that they wouldn't be able to serve uh, until after the protest period expired if we don't go with the stipulated license. I need a second. Uh, a second. Any questions from anyone? I don't have uh, any questions. I, I didn't see that the applicant is at the meeting. Um, let me scroll through just a minute to make sure. No, he's not here. So um, as I say, it, it's uh, very standard and straightforward, but it is a settlement agreement, which is important to continue the continuity of what we've done to keep things from getting out of control in Adams Morgan. Uh, questions from commissioners? And uh, how about members of the public? Okay, hearing none. Uh, let's move to a vote. Um, all those in favor of the settlement agreement? Um, as described by Commissioner Guthrie, please indicate so by saying aye. 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 Any against? Any abstentions? Okay. Um, it sounded like it's unanimous, but I don't know if everyone is there. And do, did I, was there an email that went around about this? I don't know if I saw, do I have the settlement agreement there? I know it's not linked online. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, okay. I, I sent one around and I sent the modified one around as well. Um, that's why I assume it got posted online. Um, hmm. and, and just in the cover letter, all you have to do is indicate that uh, there was a resolution allowing a uh, stipulated license to be issued. <coughs> they're not altogether sure when they're going to be ready to open, but we wanna allow them to be able to open as with their liquor license if it gets done before the end of the protest period. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, okay. Um. The only other ABC items are um, We've got a series of uh, placarding for licensees for off premises that are coming up. And um, Chris mentioned the um, Harris Teeter and um, ooh, I can't remember what the other, Argon, the Argon um, came up. I also saw that Streets was up. Um, what I would ask is for the community if they have any concerns about any of the practices or activities of the off sale um, alcohol providers to please get in touch with their commissioner or with me uh, to let us know that there is some problem that maybe we can resolve just through discussion rather than having to protest. Um, but the protest periods have been extended so we actually can protest things I think by the December meeting if it's necessary. 
I put out a notice um, that was part of the community notice and mentioned it at the ABC meeting. And I have heard no complaints about the operations of Argonne or um, Harris Teeter. So uh, there's no reason to protest if there isn't a problem with their practices. Okay. Um, all right. So, um, and then uh, I see that there's another agenda item about discussing Unity Park issues. Uh, yeah, that, that's sort of a general one that includes um, public service and the environment. Um, we, we had some discussion at the ABC committee um, mm -hmm. about the issues, but they go far beyond um, sort of the public safety aspect of it. It needs to be a more coherent solution and it's not something that is at this point at least susceptible to um, an ANC resolution that would be helpful in resolving it. It's one of those ongoing things that we need to keep talking and need to keep working on issues surrounding it. Right, right, of course, yeah. I feel like I'm on a, I talk about Unity Park all the time. There's a, there's a running meeting. Um, okay, so, um, all right. I guess that's the conclusion of ABC and Public Safety Committee business. Right. Uh, so moving on to, PZT committee business. Um, there's a request for zoning relief at 1630 Columbia Road. Um, I think uh, I had seen that the applicant was here. Uh, there she is, Hope Richardson. Hi. So, hello there. Um, would you like to share your screen or provide um, the plans and a description of your project? Sure, thank you. And leave your requesting, please. Um, I don't know that I currently have the capacity to do that. Do I need to be? Promoted her to panelist. Thanks, Gordon. You may not be able to screen share. You may have to log off and log back on. Sometimes that works for me. Can everybody see? Yes, yeah, perfect. Great, thanks for bearing with me. Um, this is the Silva. We've been working with the community for a long time on it. It's under construction. Uh, we're applying for special exception relief to have a commercial adjunct use at the site here. I've shown it in green. It would be a cafe. Currently the cafe is permitted as uh, restricted in use only to its residents. And this application allows the cafe to be used by the greater public. Um, and I also have listed here, part of that special exception relief is an area variance relief. Um, we worked hard to meet six of the seven requirements of that special exception relief. Uh, one of them is that we're within a quarter mile of the MU 5A zone uh, across Mozart Place. So that's part of the relief as well. Um, we Look forward to welcoming residents to the cafe. We think it's a great amenity to our tenants. Um, happy to take any questions. See if we have uh, some questions here. I have a question if that's okay. Please, please do. Uh, um, it was, let me preface this by saying, it seems to me that it would not be adverse to community interests to have this open to the public. It actually, I think would be a benefit to the community, but um, our, our community expert in um, zoning issues suggests that there's a problem with the way that this has been approached from a legal standpoint 
in that you're requesting an area variance relief rather than a use relief. And what you're asking for is uh, a change in use, which has a different standard um, that to me at least looks like could not be met. Um, and that it would require some sort of rezoning of the property to mixed use rather than residential that may have other sorts of tax impacts or um, you know, considerable problems or a change to the regulations themselves to allow for an exception like this, which seems to me a legitimate thing to do as far as use goes, but doesn't seem to me based on the analysis from a community member um, does not seem to me to be consistent with what the regulations are regarding um, use variances as opposed to area variances. So I'm feeling in sort of a quandary here in that I, I think it is a benefit to the community. I, I have a substantial problem with glossing over the fact that it does not seem to meet the technical requirements of the zoning code. Um, so I'm not quite sure how to deal with this. I, I voted to approve it on the committee level. I still actively believe and support that this support the concept. I think it's a good concept. It may well be that the Office of Planning, if we did not oppose this, that the Office of Planning and uh, BZA would just sort of let it rubber stamp through, even though it's not consistent with the regulations on how to do this. Um, but I wanted to bring that up to the community and to the commission so that we're aware of what we are doing or aren't doing on this. There are, um, thank you, Commissioner Guthrie, for articulating that. Uh, Ms. Richardson, do you have uh, yeah. something to say? I'd like to ask Meredith Maldenhauer on my legal team. Hopefully, she can speak to those concerns. Sure, of course. Uh, I think Meredith's line is just muted, but. Okay, I believe I've unmuted. Can you hear me now? Yeah, we sure can. Go right okay, ahead. Let me see if I can. I, I don't, for some reason, I'm try also trying to share my, my, my image with you so you don't have to just look at this random picture, but I am um, not being as adept at doing that. So I apologize right now. Um, so to answer commissioner's question, uh, this is appropriately a use, uh, not a use variance, but rather an area variance. Um, the board has, you know, in uh, many cases found that when you are asking for relief from a sub condition for a special exception, that a area variance is the appropriate area of relief because the use itself is permitted in the zone by special exception. The only area that you're asking for relief from is a numerical uh, distance relief uh, here, um, the proximity uh, to another zone, and that that then is a sub area uh, variance, and that it is not a use variance. Um, I, again, I think that the overall issue here is that it is a use that is permi permitted by special exception, and thus is consistent with the zone plan and you know, as the commissioner indicated, does not have an adverse impact, but I think at the end of the day, a benefit. Um, but legally, you know, having seen other similar cases and other similar uh, relief where there is requests from the sub condition for a special exception, we believe that we are uh, correct legally here and asking for the right area of relief. That actually makes some sense um, as you explained it. Thank you. Um, it, Part of the challenge with dealing with any of these zoning issues is that there is a lot of language that has regular understandable meaning to the rest of us, but is being used in some arcane and uh, unusual way when applied to the zoning code so that it's difficult to parse what the regulations are. But I did note the language that you just cited as a possible uh, way to, as a workaround, to turn it into an area variance rather than a use variance, but it was using language that is has a common meaning that does not seem consistent with the technical meaning. Um, and I'm 
quite willing with that ex explanation to uh, go forward and, and uh, approve the uh, request and support the request uh, consistent with the motion that uh, got sent out of the committee on this. Okay. Um, thank you, Commissioner Guthrie. Uh, thanks, Meredith and Hope. Uh, other uh, questions from commissioners? Uh, I see that we have um, a hand up uh, in the audience. So go right ahead, Mr. James. Hi, this is Dennis James speaking. Am I part of the meeting now? Yes, you are. Okay, I'm just calling in. That's why I asked. Um, I understood that our, you know, uh, our very knowledgeable neighbor, Larry Hargrove, would be monitoring the meeting, and he's the one who, uh, you know, was raising some of these concerns about the process of the zoning. But I just want to ask the applicants to uh, more completely describe what's going to go on there, and I won't be coy about it. It's a residential zone, so I hope that you're not considering, you know, that it's, I hope it's understood that there will be no availability of the liquor license because they can't be issued in our zone. We had intended to apply for a liquor license as part of a larger community process, but we hadn't gotten there yet pending the zone. I, I, there's, no, there's no possibility of it because it's simply that they're not issued to our zones. Well, I think a liquor license process is uh, something that would have to go before the ANC. And so that would be a separate process later on down the road as uh, Ms. Richardson already stated. Well, that's not really an answer, you know, and I don't like that sort of, um, <laughs> you know, sidestepping, telling the community what's really going on. So in other words, you came to the community, said there's gonna be a cafe, and only because I asked the question that we now know that you're seeking an ABC license. But I just want everybody on the commission to understand that, you know, there are no liquor licenses that can be issued in a residence zone. And that's what this is. R, what is it, RA4? So even if the zoning relief is granted, that doesn't change the underlying zoning. There's just no chance that it's ever going to happen. You know, there's some old ones that are um, grandfathered in from when the zoning and ABC codes were different than they are now. You know, just very few sprinkled around the city. I think there's a few in Georgetown, but they're not, I don't even think they're restaurants. I think they're like B markets where you can, beer, you know, beer and wine sort of places you can buy to take home for use. Okay. Anyway, thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Mr. James. Um, so seeing no other comments uh, or questions, um, Meredith, Hope, uh, is there anything you want to add to that last uh, comment about the liquor license? No, thank you. OK. Um, so let, why don't we call to a vote? Uh, all those in favor um, of uh, the ANC supporting the zoning relief sought at 1630 Columbia Road. Uh, please indicate so by saying aye. Aye. Okay. Aye. Uh, any against? Any abstentions? Okay. That's, you know, thank you, Meredith, and thank you, Hope. Thank you so much, Commissioners. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Commissioners. Okay, um, let's keep going here. So the second item is a consideration for a letter of support uh, for the proposed holiday display at uh, BB&T Plaza. This came out of PZT as well with the recommendation that we write a letter of support. Uh, Kristen, have you received um, permits for this project? Um, yes, um, DDOT has issued us the, the permit for um, the public space permit for BB&T Plaza. So then 
a letter of support is not even needed at this time, right? No, it's not needed. Um, you know, we if if the ANC you know would like to do that, that's wonderful. But at this point, it's not needed. No. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, great. Um, love the project. Thanks for presenting it at the last couple of meetings. Um, looking forward to seeing it up. Yeah. Uh, sure. Why don't we table? I'm sorry. I moved to table this resolution. Um, I second that. Um, call to a vote. All those in favor of tabling uh, the letter of support, please indicate so by saying aye. 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 Any against? Any abstentions? That is tabled. Um, and moving to a letter of support for a traffic safety assessment questionnaire for Ontario Road. Um, is there somebody that would like to speak to this? Um, I think there was a Christopher Cole um, that had proposed this, had put together a questionnaire, a traffic safety assessment questionnaire. If he's not on the line, um, perhaps Commissioner Bowles or Nick from RCNA would like to speak to it. Yeah, um, I can talk about it a little bit. Uh, it isn't the Christopher Cole, the person who's filling it out is in the neighboring district, but it splits Ontario Road. Um, essentially, this is just one of the numerous traffic studies that residents have now taken to, um, to call on DDOT to ensure that their neighborhoods um, have slower streets. Um, and this was a specific uh, street and specific spot that they wish to get attention. And um, I'm personally supporting it. And I believe that uh, Commissioner uh, Jackson is as well. And um, that's technically all that's needed for DDOT uh, to move forward. Um, but we want to bring this to a community discussion um, with these as well as RCNAs. And I believe there might be one more um, just so we ha they have great weight behind them. And uh, so we can uh, tackle this holistically. And which one is the 2000 block on Ontario Road? Uh, it's Calorama to Florida. Um, I don't have the, yeah. hit, the traffic study in front of me. Right. It, it, it says uh, 2000 block of Ontario Road, residential street between Florida and Calorama, as well as between Calorama and Euclid Street. Um, Commissioner Jackson, are you in favor of this in your SMB? Yes. Yeah. yeah, okay. Um, comments from uh, other commissioners or members of the public? Okay, hearing none. Um, all those in favor of uh, a letter of support for the uh, traffic safety assessment questionnaire for Ontario Road, uh, please indicate so by saying aye. 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 Any against? Any abstentions? Okay. All right. Um, moving to uh, Resolution on slow streets. Um, this is, uh, as we all know, um, slow, slow streets were uh, first uh, implemented as a set of measures uh, taken to allow people to uh, physically distance themselves um, and reduce the number of times you would come into contact with folks uh, on sidewalks. Um, this is all a set of measures to prevent the spread of COVID-19. Um, and what Slow Streets does is it restricts streets to local traffic only, and it uh, lowers the speed limit to 15 miles an hour. Uh, so what this can do is it makes our local roads uh, a little safer for those that are walking, running, exercising, cycling, 
um, or just getting out of the way on the sidewalk um, when they're attempting to physically distance themselves. So right now, 19th Street, for instance, uh, in Ward 1 is a slow street. So that's from um, Florida Avenue all the way up to, uh, what is that, Biltmore? Yeah. Um, that entire stretch of 19th is a slow street. Um, and what this resolution does is it requests that DDOT expand its slow street initiative um, to five more, more streets and the resolution indicates which blocks of those streets that those are and it further it furthermore it goes on to ask that dpw officers make minor adjustments to the placement of these lightweight barriers uh, that, that indicate uh, the presence of a slow street because as anyone knows that has been around a slow street these barriers tend to get grow legs and move um, and they tend to move around a whole lot. And so uh, it would be nice if DPW officers who are out and about anyhow in our neighborhood could just be mindful of them and put them into place uh, in, so that they can serve their intended purpose. Uh, so, uh, and in addition to that, the other thing that this resolution calls for are speed measuring strips, traffic volume counters, and anything that we could put into place that would provide us with metrics on the effect of slow streets so that we could uh, properly judge uh, how the initiative is working. So um, this did come out of committee uh, unanimously. Um, and with that short intro, I want to open it up to questions um, for commissioners. See, hearing none, seeing none, move it up to members of the public. Mr. James. Mr. James. Okay. All right. Can you hear me? Yep. Sure can. Okay. So um, I really raised my hand on that last thing that you voted on the D dot request because it was never revealed in what your speech contained that that was also a request to make um, Ontario Road one way. And with a bike lane, I mean, it wasn't even discussed. Exactly. So, you know, pardon me? Somebody said something? It doesn't matter. The motion, we're not on that right now. Who's running the meeting? Okay, um, so, uh, uh, Mr. I just James. think that it's a huge, you know, problem when the ANC presents something, you know, for the first time, although it was discussed verbally without great detail at the PZT meeting, there was no mention, you know, there was no, that form had not been filled out at that point. And now we see the form and it's got something that, you know, was never even raised by Amir as he ran the meeting. And I think that's a real shortcoming. So anyway, um, I just think that uh, the ANC is just going on this current resolution, resolution that's in front of you. Is it an error, the third bullet point, 700 to the 1800 block of Euclid Street Northwest? Is that possibly supposed to be 1700 to 1800 Euclid? Oh, that, yeah, that does look like an error. Yeah. Okay. I just think that it's too many streets. You're interfering with the flow of traffic. I'm against people speeding. You know, I do think it's hard to speed in this neighborhood, except once in a great while, because there's usually so much traffic and there's usually delivery vehicles all over the place, you know, FedEx, UPS, et cetera. 
that it makes it very difficult to go very fast. But, you know, I think that the more you add to this, it's going to make it just hard to get a round in the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. So I'm not in favor of just doing it willy nilly because somebody, you know, there's no justification in particular for those streets. You know, why those particular blocks? Isn't Quarry Road a dead end street? I'm pretty sure it is. You know, there's no chance of cut through there. So anyway, those are my comments. I, you know, the ANC is probably going to approve this, but it just seems like it's like somebody's little hobby to make up all these things when it hasn't really been discussed very well within the community. And, you know, the idea of the signs, it's to announce that there's a slow street ahead. It's not supposed to block you from getting in there. What if you live there? You want to be able to drive into that block and park your vehicle within a reasonable distance from your house, which isn't very easy to do. But it's just sort of like, you're just trying to make it hard for all vehicle owners. I mean, people with kids, dogs, and all the rest of it. It's just, it seems like it's such a huge overreaction. Anyway, I'm not going to speak anymore. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Jones. Um, so, uh, I'll briefly, uh, bring up the traffic safety assessment questionnaire in that, um, this required the signing off, uh, from the commissioner whose SMD it is. Commissioner Jackson was very clear that he was in, in support of it. So, um, that would have passed and moving on to, uh, the moving back to this resolution on slow streets. Uh, we have another question or a hand up rather. Uh, from Zach Gold. So go right ahead. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, on this issue, I think Euclid, the purpose for announcing the 800 block to 1700 block or where, where Euclid ends at uh, the Lime Hotel is that a lot of these slow streets, 19th included, uh, which goes from, I believe, Q Street all the way up to, um, to, to uh, Biltmore, uh, is, is to have a very long almost cross neighborhood way for walkers and runners and families and people on bikes. And so having something that goes from uh, Adams Morgan to um, Parkview in, in my mind would be really great. And I'm, uh, I, I regret that the previous speaker has, has not spent much time on the east side of the neighborhood where Quarry Road uh, is a very frequently used cut through uh, from Columbia Road trying to beat traffic at Harvard uh, and Columbia and 16th Street. And so many people uh, sh shoot uh, left on to Quarry Road from Columbia Road and uh, go up Lanier to Argonne uh, to make their way faster to Mount, uh, to Mount Pleasant Street. And so uh, th that is the reason for suggesting having a slow street um, sign up uh, again so that the people who live on travel to are providing services on quarry road and lanier place can still get there but they will travel you know slowly uh, and uh, those who are trying to beat a traffic light will be hopefully dissuaded from going through there and i really appreciate the idea of having metrics uh, for whether these slow streets are working because obviously uh, the intention is for them to work. So thank you very much. Thank you, Zach. And uh, yeah, to be, uh, just to clarify uh, the Euclid, the, the blocks of Euclid being requested are the 700 block to the 1800 block of Euclid. Um, so uh, questions or hands up, uh, Commissioner Guthrie. Yeah, I, I um, was wondering about the Euclid one in particular, because at least in the um, suggestion that came out of uh, Council Member Nadeau's office um, about pairing streets to turn them into one ways going one direction or another, Euclid was being paired in Adams Morgan with Columbia Road in, in some way to... Uh, facilitate smoother traffic. And I, I know that Euclid itself is very heavily trafficked that they indicated that the 16th street 
and Euclid intersection was a failed intersection at least four or five years ago because it has excess traffic and you know too many people for the light cycles to be able to function well. Um, I'm not sure that DDOT will be willing to um, turn Euclid into a local street, um, but I have no problem with supporting the resolution as a whole. Um, mm -hmm. I just wanted to make that caveat. Okay, okay. Um, hmm. And this is for the, uh, um, for the duration of the health emergency, just to be clear there, these slow streets. So it's not a permanent change here. Um, and Mr. Roth. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, uh, I, I, I want to propose um, a, um, what I hope is a, a sort of practical um, compromise, particularly with regard to um, Champlain and Ontario. Um, what I'm thinking specifically about is traffic that has to exit the um, Harris Teeter parking lot on Calorama. Um, if, if you're exiting the, the Harris Teeter parking lot on Calorama to get across to the west side of the neighborhood, um, you really only have a couple of ways to get out of there. Um, you can turn left on um, Ontario, you can turn left on Champlain Street. Um, if you turn left on Champlain Street, um, particularly if school's not in session, you can keep going down the street uh, to Florida Avenue, um, or you can turn right on Calorama Road to 18th Street. Uh, but that is a it's a it's a bad turn. It's a tight turn, particularly if um, one of those um, rent a cars or rent a rent a vans is parked on that corner. Um, the 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 proposal here has those slow streets beginning. Um, you know, far south of Calorama Road. Um, and, you know, for the sake of the flow of traffic and, and the ability of people just to be able to traverse the neighborhood if they're shopping at Harris, at Harris Teeter, um, uh, you know, the, the notion behind slow streets is in part as you described it, but it's also particularly um, aimed at um, identifying these streets as local traffic only and people who are exiting the Harris Teeter uh, are not going to be local traffic only. Um, and so uh, yeah, I would urge some consideration for the notion of starting the slow streets um, on Champlain and Ontario to begin on the north side of Calorama rather than that far south. That's my comment. So um... One thing I'll say is that, uh, and um, just as you were speaking, I'll throw out that uh, slow, slow streets don't apply to residents. Um, and it doesn't address what you're saying uh, there, but I think given what was being said, I, I think that that's, that should be uh, thrown out there uh, as uh, a point of information. Um, but so where would you propose what, uh, how would you propose to edit the blocks being requested? Well, I, I'm not sure where the, I'm not sure which block number begins on the north side of Calorama, but, um, you know, it, I, I can't remember off the top of my head, what's the address of Mary Center? Is it 2300 or 20, is it? Is uh, it Mary I, Center, uh, let me see. That's 2333. Yeah, 23. Yeah. yeah, so, you know, I would I would suggest maybe the 2300 block of Ontario Road, and I assume it's the 2300 block of Champlain Street, although I'm not 100% sure, because because it angles down a little bit on Champlain, but it's it's wherever that wherever that turn is. I think that turn is the 22 or 23. Um, hmm. So, 
question. What are we talking about in my single member district exactly? We're, ta we're talking about um, enabling, enabling traffic exiting your single member district to be able to get through to the other side of the neighborhood. Yeah, so that intersection at Calorama and Champlain is god awful and is literally the first conversation I've had with any DDOT person since January of last year. It is awful, terrible, <coughs> awful. And I think, I don't know what we else need to do, um, but clearly the constant rotation of staff at DDOT or something has not fixed this intersection. I mean, uh, I have numerous emails. I don't know if this is what's gonna it need to take, but it's terrible. It's really, really bad. And I think there's numerous solutions. I'm not a traffic expert, so I think we should throw it to those people. Um, but yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm down to offer plenty of solutions. I have dozens of residents who talk about it. I mean, I walk there, I walk every day. Um, it's not a fun intersection for vehicles, for cyclists, for pedestrians. Um, so yeah, I mean, I would just encourage us to pass something so we can follow up to get this intersection adjusted, hopefully by the end of next term. So uh, yeah, I think we're all, we're all in agreement on that. The only question here is, is it, it, where do you where do you put the local traffic only sign? <laughs> and I, I'm just suggesting putting it on the on the on the north side of that on the north side of that inter, of, of that intersection at Calorama Road, so that so that traffic coming out of Calorama is able to turn left. So that would make it from uh, so if it's north so. Uh, that'll be the 20, it'll limit this to the 2300 block of Ontario to the 2900 block. Um, and then on Champlain, it would take out the 2100 and the, that's a, you know, the way Champlain and Colorado, the 2200 of Champlain. So this will be, so instead of 21 to 25, it'll be 2300 to 2500 blocks of Champlain. And instead of 2100 to 2900 of Ontario, it'll be 2300, I suppose. Yeah, because the 2200 block is where that, is where uh, Calorama Road hits it. So that's the proposed change. Do I have that proposed change uh, right there? Alan? Yeah, that would be my suggestion. Yeah, right. Um, or, or you could put in in, um, in parenthesis after the Champlain Street um, uh, entry there, you could put in parenthesis north of the Calorama Road intersection. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. You could, put, you could put 2200 Champlain paren north of the Calorama Road intersection. Yeah because it really is just a, a small part of Champlain. Um, so, um, and this would uh, help with access to Harris Teeter. Or from, from Harris Teeter specifically, yeah. yeah. Uh, so, uh, comments from commissioners? Uh, Commissioner Guthrie? Yeah, I'm, I'm not clear about this. It, what we're talking about doing is uh, recommending that Ontario and Champlain be designated as safe streets under the COVID, but that does not preclude um, traffic on Calorama that actually has to share Champlain for whatever that is, less than a quarter block um, as it zigs through the neighborhood. Um, it, it would not be part of that program with the exception that, you know, there would be a designation. It's sort of an expanded um, strange intersection to me because the intersection goes for about a quarter of a block because of the way Calorama zigzags through there. Um, mm -hmm. but it, it certainly having that portion of, of Champlain designated as a safe street would not preclude you from going across on Calorama Road that I can see. 
I'm not understanding what the concern is. No, I guess uh, what I'm suggesting is there, there are times when, there are times when, I mean, I, I certainly have done this. I've gone south on Ontario. I've gone south on Champlain when school's not in session. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right, but you're going south. Uh, you're going south on Champlain when school's not in session for no more than the block that gets you down to Florida or to California, right? No, no, no. Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, exactly. Yeah. But, so, but but the twenty oh, but but tw the twenty one hundred block takes you all the way down that way. The proposal is to, uh, instead of saying it from the 2100 block, to call it from the 2300 block of Ontario. Right, but my point is that designation of a safe street in that stretch yeah. where the school is, south of Calorama, mm -hmm. would not have any practical impact on your being able to traverse that since you're only going a block on it. And under the safe streets program, you're certainly mm -hmm. able to go um, you know, that block before you get off of it. Um, yeah, that, that's, that's true. It's true, except that navigating through those barriers is a huge pain in the butt. Well, that's true with any of the safe streets. Yeah, but I, I'm, yeah, the, the, pur the purpose of it ostensibly is to, well, I shouldn't say the purpose. They're, they're designed to, um, they say that there's, they're, they say on them local traffic only. That's what the sign says. Local right. traffic only. And 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 that's not what that's not what this is. It's not local traffic only. If you're proceeding from Harris Teeter on Calorama, turning left on Champlain and mm -hmm. proceeding for one block on Champlain down across uh, across across California or Florida to go to the other side of the neighborhood. That's not local traffic only. That's not what they mean. They, they mean what Dennis was referring to, which is neighbors, residents trying to access their houses. Well, what, what I'm suggesting is you're going no further than two blocks on Champlain to do that because of the way Champlain is divided up. There's, there's only California and um, Florida the other thing to think about is that there. residents um, have access to slow streets, it, so it's uh, it doesn't it's, really apply. It's, well, I, I don't think it would. I don't think it, that it would prohibit someone in Alan's situation from being able to use that portion of Champlain that allows him to get down to uh, California or Florida. Okay, uh, that's six and one half dozen. That's okay. I'll take Ontario. <laughs> so um the uh commissioner who's single member district it is commissioner bowles do you have comments yeah i think the ontario streets make the most sense i mean i would love slow streets everywhere um but i don't really know i think the solution to that intersection is just getting rid of a few parking spots yeah and, I agree. and or making colorama a one-way but I want the experts to decide that. Um, so, yeah, I mean, if the slow streets, all that is is just a giant sign that says slow streets, and then most of the time the residents push it to the corner or the side anywhere, anyway, right. I don't see Cal anywhere on Calorama it being, at least from Calorama, on Calorama from Ontario to Champlain, that street's just way too narrow. There's already too many issues. It's um, with it's two way vehicular traffic and a parking lane, and it can't be more than 24, <laughs> 24 feet. Um, so, and then, I mean, I think Ontario makes the most sense. And then if we wanted to do something higher up in the block to slow traffic down on Champlain, I'm super in favor of that. But I think that the slow streets thing is just like signs at the ends of both streets, which like, really slow the street the car just as slowly drives around the sign and then speeds up until the until the next sign and then they slow around that sign so if they want to put a sign in the middle of the intersection or in the middle of champlain street i'm here for that <laughs> i yeah, mean people wouldn't see the sign they wouldn't know it's local traffic only you can't put it in the middle of the street mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so, uh, Commissioner Bowles, uh, were you saying that you are in favor of the proposed change to 2300 to 2500 Champlain or not? Of Champlain, uh, I mean, yeah, whatever, yeah, whatever attention to slow streets that we can get, the better. Okay, so um, I'll take that then as a friendly. Um, from 2100 to 25. 500 will be edited to read 2300 to 2500 Champlain. And then on Ontario, uh, what were there feelings about, um, I mean, I totally get that little section there. Um, I don't think that there's gonna be a sign there at that part of the intersection uh, on that block of Ontario, 21, 2200 block, 2100 block. Um, but what, are, what were the feelings about 2100 changing that to 2200 um, and in parentheses, something indicating uh, that uh, it's at the intersection of Calram and Ontario? I got it reversed. I had it reversed? Yeah, I, I, I thought we were talking about, the, I thought the parentheses were gonna go by Champlain and the, and the, the 2300 was gonna be um, oh yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah, that's exactly what I meant. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Sorry. But I, I was, I, you know, I was ready to give up on, you know, Ted. I understood Ted's point, and um, you know, I said, you know, okay, like Ted. You know, Ted. Ted was. Ted was making a strong case for running it all the way down Champlain. And um, I said, okay, like, we'll just use Ontario for, you know, the, the couple blocks down Ontario as a as an exit option if you don't want to traverse Calorama. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, okay, so the uh, proposed change at the 20... 200 block of Ontario. Uh, wait, what did I say? There? 23. 2300 block, yeah. <laughs> and the 2200 block of Champlain. Um, at pro at uh, the intersection of Calorama Road and Champlain. Okay, so um, I've gone ahead and added that into the resolution. If uh, you guys are following uh, the live edits, how does that look, those two friendlies there? Uh, commissioners, members of the public. So it now reads 2200 to 2500 Champlain beginning at the intersection of Calorama Road and Champlain Street. Um, and then the next one is 2300 to 2900 Ontario. I thought that we had an agreement to let the Champlain one go all the way down to Florida. We did? Yep. <laughs> I thought that's. I thought that I, I was. I was agreeing with Commissioner Guthrie. Yeah. I, 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 was, he, I was conceding Commissioner Guthrie's point. Uh, I see. Okay. Okay. Yeah. There's a. Well, you know, I'm fine with uh, either of them. I know that I'm. I just. I hate crossing that intersection. There's no daylighting. We need to remove some parked cars there. Okay. So 2100 to 2500 Champlain. Um, that is done. All right. So uh, questions from commissioners, members of the public. Um, I see we have one hand up. Um, Mr. James. Hi, Dennis James again. Am I heard? Yes, please go ahead. Thanks. Okay, so I strongly object 
to the 700 block of Euclid Street being included in this resolution, it's not in Adams Morgan. ANC 1C is the ANC for Adams Morgan, not parts of Columbia Heights. It's absurd, you know? Just deal with what's within your boundaries. Uh, you know, it's it, within the, your boundaries would be the 1600 block to, um, let's see, Euclid. I, I'm not exactly sure of the intent there. 1800 Euclid. Um, I'm sorry. I, I, I'm not an expert enough on that. The 100 blocks there. I think you, I think it would take you to uh, Champlain. Although there may not actually be an 1800, it might be like 1799 or something like that. Anyhow, but I think the bigger this was point, a typo. That, um, sorry to interrupt you. I think this was a typo, right? This was supposed to be 17. No, no. Zach explained that he wanted it to go over to Park View or whatever, and that's not Park View. It's Columbia Heights. But oh, anyway. Okay. okay, sorry. Yeah, but beyond that, this resolution would be in opposition to the one uh, where the neighbor filled out the form and the ANC, you know, supported it because that one says that Ontario Road would be one way northbound. You know, so <laughs> this is called yeah. Slow Street. Um, huh? Ontario, you know, you make, you make, I'm not uh, sure exactly what way road. I'm not sure what's going to be approved, but you know, if Ontario from Florida north were made one way, then Allen couldn't turn left onto Ontario to get to Florida anymore if he chose that way of getting away from Harris Teeter. And it's not just Allen. I mean, they, Harris Teeter has hundreds and thousands of customers. I mean, how about the economic impact on Harris Teeter? It's a valuable resource in our neighborhood. You know, and well, this, this, uh, thank you for your comments, uh, Mr. James. Uh, the resolution um, doesn't, uh, there was an earlier iteration of this, of this resolution that included Calorama Road um, that was removed. Um, and we've made some amendments to also uh, accommodate the concerns that were raised tonight, um, in addition to the concerns that were raised at PZT. Um, and on the comment about uh, this ANC only dealing with matters that uh, have to do within the geographic boundaries of Adams Morgan. This ANC is weighed in on matters uh, that are outside of the geographic bounds of Adams Morgan many times. Uh, I think we have to do that. Uh, all of our streets are connected. Our residents go in and out of Adams Morgan and are affected um, whenever they leave Adams Morgan, right? So, and come right back in. And we've, we have uh, you know another item on the agenda tonight about um, connected uh, bike lanes um, connecting DuPont. Um, so in any case, uh, hearing no other discussion, um, I'd like to move to a vote. Um, all those in favor of the uh, Slow Streets resolution as this came out of committee unanimously, by the way, so it doesn't need a second. All those in favor of the resolution as indicated, please indicate so by saying aye. 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 Any against? Any abstentions? Okay. Let's uh, march forward. Um, the next item on the agenda is a resolution requesting that uh, DDOT give us some feedback um, and respond to the re repeated resolutions that we have passed. But I'm happy to report. Um, so we have, uh, this resolution just basically goes point by point over a lot of the items that our ANC has passed over the last two years. Um, and they're bullet pointed in the resolution. There's about seven of them there. Um, and over the last few weeks, uh, month or so, um, we've had a lot of uh, very encouraging developments, including news about uh, the um, Capital Bike Share Station going in 
Um, that one, you know, we passed about a year ago and now it's coming in. Uh, there's an update. Uh, there's a service request number that's been issued for the crosswalk at 19th and Biltmore. Um, the Hawk signal apparently will be going in, though I'm trying to get a specific uh, date on that. Um, these were all items that four weeks ago, five weeks ago, we had no feedback on. So we've gotten quite a bit of feedback lately. Um, the connected and protected bike lanes that we passed last year between the DuPont Circle, it's related to the Deckover project between DuPont Circle and Adams Morgan and adding, so that's the connected portion and the protected portion uh, between on Columbia Road between Connecticut and 16th Street. Um, there are apparently internal discussions going on. Um, that particular uh, part of Columbia Road is a bus priority route um, and they are in the early stages of uh, safety improvements for the bus lane, the bike lane and pedestrian safety in general. They, uh, DDOT expects uh, concept development to uh, be starting in late 2021. Some of the issues with creating a protected bike lane there, other than being a bus priority route, is that it would require the removal of parking on one side of Columbia Road in order to accommodate a protected bike lane. So like I said, there's concept development moving there. Um, late 2021 um, and uh, the traffic study that we requested that uh, commissioners had spent hours at the intersection of Florida U Street and 18th Street uh, we requested I mean it was a multi-page resolution with um, lots of uh, detailed observations and uh, what I've heard now from DDOT is that the safety and signal teams are reviewing uh, the those uh, those items, uh, so we expect to hear back. Finally, the micro mobility corrals are being installed. Um, so there's a handful of things that are on here that are, I've gotten word that are going to be installed, some that are in progress. And the one ways actually, um, which is the penultimate bullet point there um, about Calorama, Wyoming and California Street, California Street being a one way, but there was a traffic calming measure requested there. Uh, that one is currently, uh, there apparently has been a one-way study done there. Um, so we are waiting on that official update on that one. So that was a mouthful, um, but the purpose of this resolution was to get DDOT moving on these items and to raise these items again. Um, and over the last couple of weeks, uh, we've all been sending emails and um, related to this resolution, but also getting just updates, trying to push uh, this needle um, to get change, the change that we have requested over the last two years uh, to get that affected in our neighborhood. And a lot of those items have gone through. I think it's important that our commission still vote this out unanimously so that we can get these items, uh, still keep them top of mind. Uh, or DDOT. So that's a mouthful. I'll stop, take questions, if there are any from commissioners. I heartily agree with your analysis. Uh, DDOT has been the least responsive agency in DC government for all of the many requests that we've been make, making over a prolonged period of time. And I think it's important to have it consolidated in one place, demonstrating their lack of response and possibly that would be worthwhile sending to the supervising council member on transportation issues um, and make it clear that there is a continuing problem here. So is that a hardly agree or you heartily agree? <laughs> heartily, heartily. Because <laughs> I heard hardly at first, I was like, huh, but you're repeating. Okay, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so I'll accept friendly about uh, sending this also to, um, that would be council member Mary Che, who is chair. Um, so okay. other uh, comments from commissioners? I got a friendly to that as well um, and have it be sent to the deputy mayor 
um, for transportation and infrastructure. Um, Lucinda Babbers, I believe, is um, the one who is the deputy mayor of DDOT, uh, or that oversees DDOT. And uh, I would love for her to know that, you know, we are seeking these types of uh, changes in the neighborhood um, as she has one-on-one -on -one conversations with the mayor. Um, and uh, I think it would be good to help elevate our requests. Okay. And she's, and she's actually responsive. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, share this resolution authorize maybe a uh, ANC one C authorize. No, I think just share this resolution. No letter needed. Um, share this resolution with. Can you uh, give me spelling? Commissioner Bowles? I wanna make sure to spell it right. Sure. Okay, it is, I'll just put it in the chat. Got it. Okay. It's how it sounds, but. Well, just tell me. Yeah. Ah, there we go. Okay. Lucinda. Babber. And what is her title? Sorry. Deputy. Deputy Mayor for Operations and Infrastructure. Okay. Operations and infra. And I do have it on um, good intel that uh, she would be interested in attending an ANC meeting um, in the future. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, other uh, comments from commissioners? Members of the public. Okay, so I have put those friendlies into the resolution. Um, Thank you, commissioners, for that. Um, there's a third, uh, be it resolved, that ANC wants to send this resolution to Councilman Mary Che, chair of the DC Council Committee on Transportation and the Environment, as well as Lucinda Babber, Deputy Mayor for Operations and Infrastructure. Okay. Um, hearing no other questions, oh, we got one hand up. Jay Swiderski. I just wanted to uh, elevate from the chat. Her name is Babers with an S. Oh, okay. So. Got, it. Got it. Thank you. Did, right. anyone, did anyone hear if there was any uh, outcome from the auditors general's uh, report earlier this year about DDOT's responsiveness or lack thereof? On the auditor's report. Oh, the... I uh, believe it was the auditor general that had a, a report saying that uh, DDOT... Uh, a great weight auditing. Uh, yeah, and, and the, their lack thereof. Mm -hmm. I remember reading that. Uh, I... I think uh, consistent with DDOT's regular policy, I'm sure it's under consideration. <laughs> okay, uh, hearing no other uh, discussion, 
Uh, this came out of committee uh, unanimously, so I'll move to a vote. Um, all those in favor of the resolution as indicated, please indicate so by saying aye. 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 Any, any against? Any abstentions? All right, that's six zero. Okay. Okay, um, moving on to the next item on our agenda. Um, traffic safety assessments requested by Reed Cook Neighborhood Association. So Nick uh, or Commissioner Bowles. This also came out of committee um, with unanimous support. Hi. Um, yeah, so as, as was mentioned uh, earlier in the call, particularly the intersection at Colorama and Champlain, um, speeding on Ontario, um, the intersections of Champlain and Euclid, um, there's just been a lot of traffic issues in the neighborhood that neighbors have been complaining about. And so we wanted to do an assessment to see if there are statistics behind those complaints. And so that's why we've uh, filled out these traffic safety assessments and are hoping to get some DDOT attention in the neighborhood. Okay, uh, Commissioner Bowles, um, could you go over the uh, proposed uh, remedies if there are any proposed in the traffic safety assessments? So I don't believe that there are any proposed. Um, they just want studies to see what works best for the community and according to the experts. Are there some? Um, I mean, we can definitely talk about some of the things that we discussed at the PCT meeting um, that came from that, but I don't think that the Neighborhood Association is really interested in saying, hey, we want a speed bump here or, um, you know, bulb outs here. They really want anything and everything that uh, would slow vehicles down in the in the neighborhood. Okay, that's great. And uh, um, I know this is your SMD. Uh, is it anyone else's SMD here, Commissioner Jackson? I do believe there are parts that uh, Commissioner Jackson um, would need to be <coughs> in approval of. And then we don't have, I believe that one or two streets would be in former commissioner Wright's uh, ANC. And so that's why I think uh, going through the ANC routes um, covers that aspect since she, uh, since that seat is vacant. Yep, yep, okay. Um, so let's, um, if there's no, comments commissioner jackson how do you feel about yeah uh, yeah I, I support this too i'm here okay okay great uh C commissioner zatoli i saw you had your hand up there yes thank you um there's a a, a traffic issue in uh, in one co4 that um uh, merits attention and i'm wondering if it might be prudent to just add that to the uh, to the requests of, for the uh, um, recook issues well, uh, what street is it? Um, because We're talking about is... Adams Mill Road, just as it, uh -huh. as it runs past the uh, runs past Walter Pierce Park, right where that children's playground is. There's a crosswalk that connects to um, Ontario Place, and um, a lot of the cars that come that come along Adams Mill Road just don't respect that crosswalk, and uh, they're. Uh, they go by so quickly that it's easy to uh, uh, to zip past uh, uh, strollers or toddlers that are trying to cross the street. 
And, um, and I'm thinking uh, just adding that Adams Mill Road uh, crosswalk at uh, Ontario Place um, to whatever list we're providing to DDOT, it was something I'd appreciate. So I'm happy yeah. to add that as a friendly. However, um, I wouldn't be able to fill out the traffic assessment study uh, form. If Commissioner Satoli would be able to do that, I'd be glad to move forward. Um, well, thank you, I'd be happy to fill out the form. Yeah. yeah, it's, I mean, it's but a simple form. It could take five minutes and basically just explaining all of the issues there. Um, um, yeah. And, uh, yeah, um, maybe the maybe we could if it's a particular crosswalk um, that is it. It's an already it's an existing crosswalk, right? It's, it's an existing crosswalk, but one that's not respected by the drivers. Right, and uh, I'm, trying, I'm pulling it up on the map here. Um, is there some kind of you know? Could we request? Would a hawk signal be helpful? Uh, is it not visible? As as uh, Commissioner Bowles uh, described the uh, uh, the residents in his in his single member district, uh, uh, anything to slow down the traffic would be helpful. Um, mm -hmm. I, I I'm not in a position to recommend anything specifically. If if we had to come up with something, I think a right. speed bump would help uh, at least get the attention of the drivers that are zipping past. Yeah, I think uh, um, I'm in support of the request, uh, but I think. What I'd like to see is it go to committee where we can fill out the form and thoughtfully do it and then bring it to uh, the commission next month. How does that sound? Okay, be happy to do that. Sounds good, sounds good. Um, so that would be another item for our PZT agenda. Okay. And there was a mention in the chat about a raised crosswalk. Uh, John, I would love to talk to you more about adding a raised crosswalk, uh, crosswalk in uh, that area. Okay, thank you. Um, I, I just have a historical note to point out that there was a traffic hump that was traffic bump, whatever, that was put in at that location probably four years ago that wound up damaging so many cars because it was poorly executed that it was taken back out, just as an <laughs> informational point. Okay. Um, so, you know, I think that that's, it's important to think about those things. So, uh, but that's, that's the good, you know, the good thing of going through the process and uh, committee and discussion. So I'll add it as a third item to the PZT agenda for this month. Um, so, um, to the resolution at hand, um, the traffic safety assessments, any other, uh, questions there, uh, members of the public commissioners, um, hearing none, I'll, uh, call a vote. This left committee unanimously. So all those in favor of a letter of support for the traffic traffic safety assessments requested by RCNA, please indicate so by saying aye. 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 Any against? Any abstentions? All right, six zero. Thank you for that. Um, and the next item, is a discussion of the Connecticut Avenue deck over project. Um, and uh, I know that uh, Zach had, Zach Gold had uh, some very specific things there and I, and I wish our DDOT people were around to discuss this. We had asked them to attend the meeting, um, but you know, it goes to, why we're why we have a PCT agenda that takes an hour to go through, and why we pass resolutions. And anyhow, not to get off there. Um, so, Zach, do you want to uh, kick this one off? Sure. Um, thank you, um, Chairman Irani. I, uh, so, for those that don't know, the there is a 
a plan from DDOT. It's a 65% plan, so they're still working on it um, to put a, a deck and a seating area over Connecticut Avenue north of DuPont Circle. And at the same time, um, adapt the streetscape from Connecticut Avenue uh, north from, I believe, about Q Street to California Street, uh, California uh, Avenue, uh, uh, excuse me. And, um, oh no, California Street, sorry. <laughs> uh, so given, uh, you know, I don't want to make a production about this whole project, although people might have thoughts on it. Um, uh, and obviously everyone should see the uh, listed on the website uh, of the ANC is the deck over project uh, website with their plans and drawn up. And the reason that I wanted to raise this uh, tonight, and I think that it's pressing because um, DDOT has asked with a very short deadline for comments um, on, on, uh, on their 65% plan. Um, and so if the ANC is going to choose to weigh in. And again, Connecticut Avenue, at least the uh, east side of Connecticut Avenue from Florida to California Street is part of our ANC. And so I think it is uh, highly appropriate for us to weigh in, um, it, certainly there, if not for the whole project. Um, and, uh, and that's why I brought uh, this to the attention of the ANC. So thank you for, for leading a discussion, Amir. Okay, um, thank you, Zach, for uh, that introduction. Um, commissioners, um, are there questions? Uh, members of the public? I know, Zach, you, you had some very specific recommendations that when I went through them, um, they were uh, pretty reasonable. Um, so I'm happy to raise those again, just so every so folks can hear them. Um, if it's something that the commission uh, the the commission wants to vote on, um, one is you know it's my impression and, and other folks with whom I speak that the width of the Connecticut Avenue bicycle lane is actually quite narrow uh, when taken into account of the new types of bicycles that are uh, that are operating these days, especially if you're trying to bicycle with your family. Um, also taking into account the, the, the curb, the, the, the closeness of the curb um, and the, the bike lane could be ex uh, widened to more than five feet if you were to narrow some of the vehicle lanes and the vehicle lanes are actually already extra wide. Um, of course, all of us are familiar with folks who drive down Connecticut Avenue like it is a, a highway, not like it's a urban city street. And, and I think that by narrowing those, those uh, vehicle lanes, whether or not you were to, to widen the bicycle lane, but you, know, it, you can do both at the same time, that would slow down vehicle traffic. I also, from the, um, from the uh, image that is put together by, uh, by DDOT, uh, again, on, on that website for the Deckover Project, there is protection for the, for the bicycle lane along uh, Connecticut Avenue until it reaches Columbia Road, at which point that protection ends basically right after the Hilton uh, Hotel, where I think there is a pretty dangerous merger between the bicycle traffic and vehicular traffic. Um, and uh, lastly, my point was that for me, for, for us in Adams Morgan, it is great that the bicycle lane cont uh, continues uh, eastward onto Columbia Road but there doesn't seem to be a plan for either a transition or for um, tr safe travel if a, if a person on a bicycle was continuing uh, northwest on Connecticut Avenue. Um, so those are just some issues that, that came to my mind while looking over the, the plan, um, that if, um, if the commission agrees with me, perhaps that's something that we could weigh in on um, with DDOT, but, uh, but other people might have some thoughts about this project as well. So um, thanks so much for the time. Thank you, uh, Zach. I think that those are some, uh, um, is there, well, first let me ask, um, is there a comment period uh, that we're bumping up against here? The end, the end of a comment. I, 
I, I looked at their website and it looks like it ends November 6th. Right, so Friday. Um, so the width of the bike lanes uh, and the narrowing of the travel lanes here. Um, commissioners, uh, feelings, thoughts? Zach, just to clarify, the narrowing of the travel lanes is um, so that uh, speeds and um, speeds can be lowered and basic awareness um, uh, of the drivers would be yeah, higher. So, so I don't I, have the I don't have the plan in front of me at this very moment, but um, I think the the furthest right hand um, lane on both. Uh, on both northbound and southbound needs to be wider because that's because of bus travel. Um, I think it has to be uh, 11 or 13 feet for the bus. But then the, the other lanes that, you know, there are um, three lanes in each direction on Connecticut Avenue. They're also pretty wide. And, um, you know, the, the width of a lane uh, impacts how one driving feels comfortable with this with this with increasing or decreasing speed and a wider lane gives a little more berth between um other yourself and other vehicles therefore increasing one's um comfort with with traveling above the speed limit mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um hmm. and the width of the bike lane that would allow for uh um, different kinds of, because the current width of the bike lane, does, does that accommodate uh, different kinds of protection barriers? So the, the, the barrier in place is a, is a pretty good sized uh, curb barrier. Um, but uh, mm -hmm. the, the issue that I'm thinking of is that with a five foot bicycle lane, it would be very difficult for myself, who is a strong cyclist, to pass uh, someone who might be slower. And of course, there's a hill there. So I would assume many people, myself included, will be struggling going up that hill. And it will be, there's not a lot of space to um, safely and assuredly pass someone. Additionally, you know, a lot of folks have um, trailers for their children or, or cargo bikes, uh, either for families or for, for delivery. Um, and and uh, I think the lane is a bit narrow for, for those sorts of, um, bicycles to, to maneuver properly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I see a hand up. Uh, Jay Soderski, go right ahead. So with respect to the existing plan, um, I'm not sure about the requirement for uh, lane width for buses, but I can add that the current proposal is for each of the three lanes in each direction to be 11 feet, which is wider than the regular standard for streets in DC, which they, they're, I believe, required to be at least 10 feet, but 11 feet is wider than necessary. Um, and the, the bike lane has something the, to do with uh, just Connecticut Avenue being, you know, major thoroughfare. I think that they, you know, they are trying to maintain as much width for automotive traffic as they can manage, uh, in part because they're looking at the section lower down into DuPont, which, you know, has the three wide lanes in each direction. Um, I think it's worth noting that, you know, beyond the end of this project on, you know, north of California Street, the, there's only two lanes in each direction, and I believe they're also narrower. So if they've got to be narrowed at some point, and we can get more space for the bike lane, because, you know, also, I think that having 
these three wide lanes is part of why they are requiring a full three foot wide cement curb barrier between you know it's not just a three foot buffer with some flex posts like say on 15th street there's you know a big buffer and then you've only got five feet uh in the actual cycle track um and i think you know in addition to the the issues that zach noted about being able to pass people or being able to ride you know perhaps wider bikes there's also just the issue of if there are leaves down or other debris you know having only a limited amount of space makes it you know there's that much less room for error you know so if so if there's a you know a tree branch or or even just a pile of leaves in the in the cycle track, which uh, we know that uh, DPW, frankly, isn't very good at clearing out right now, um, you know, that it makes it that much harder for people to avoid that. Um, whereas, you know, even a, a little bit more space, you know, make gives it that much more space before people, you know, before it becomes a problem for people riding. Um, so I think you know, if you, if we took, you know, a foot from eat the, the automotive lanes and, you know, made them the standard 10 foot <laughs> lot width, you know, you could give a cycle track that is wide enough for, you know, people of varying abilities and, you know, it would be that much easier for you know, it would be that much more difficult for debris to to block it, and it would be that much easier for DPW to clear it and uh, keep it, you know, usable for people. Mm -hmm. So, um, thank hey, Amir, you. Do you mind if I just say one thing? Sure, go ahead. Um, so, I, I dropped in the chat. Um, there's yeah, a. a uh, there's a study going on about rever <clears throat> the re reversible lanes that are further north on Connecticut. And the working group there looks like it's going to add uh, protected bike lanes on the curbside where uh, as somebody, so you asked whether they're narrower, the, the plans that are concept now shows those 10 foot narrower lanes further up. So obviously going, there's the, the little bit north and across Rock Creek to get, because that study goes uh, Connecticut north of Calvert Street. So there's still a little gap, but basically if you're talking about a connection from DuPont Circle all the way up, mm -hmm. this would be consistent with the lane widths that, are, that they're foreseeing further north. That's helpful, yeah. Um. <clears throat> So um, what we could say in our comments is to narrow um, the width of the travel lane, the three travel lanes, right? Um, to be consistent. Okay. Um, I can put that uh, in a letter for comments. And then the width of the bike lanes. Um, well, first off, I'll pause. Are there comments from commissioners, other comments from members of the public? <clears throat> um, I personally see um, how the community can benefit from us weighing in here, um, from ANC1C weighing in here. Um, and putting in our comments before the deadline passes uh, to narrow the width of the travel lanes to be consistent with uh, those that are further north on Connecticut that we connect with um, and to increase the width of the bike lanes. Um, was there a specific um, number there? I know that the current 
there was a current five foot width, but was there a number that was thrown out, increased the width to something? I've heard an, uh, an ideal of seven feet. Okay. That's what I've heard as well. Yeah. So maybe narrowing the travel lanes and taking that and putting it there. So, okay. Width of seven feet. Okay. I think the, the spirit of these comments is captured. I'll probably uh, work on what goes exactly in the letter, but the spirit of the comments is to narrow the width of the travel lanes um, and increase the width of the bike lanes to seven feet. Um, and uh, do I have comments from commissioners? Concerns? I just want to say, uh, say thanks to um, the neighbors and the residents for moving this forward. Um, I actually don't know too much about the specifics of it, but I'm glad that we're here to offer a community discussion and uh, hopefully, uh, you know, support neighbors and the request um, and our request to just expand bike safety and uh, pedestrian safety. So thank you guys so much for putting this on our radar and uh, for allowing us to comment on it. Mm -hmm. Thank you, uh, members of the public. Anything else? Hearing none. Um, so this is, um, these will be official ANC1C comments in a letter written by the chair. So um, um, I move, what, what is the motion here? Commissioner Guthrie, help me out. This, this actually wasn't appropriately 10 days noticed, was it? I think it was noticed. Um, yeah. I think it was noticed, but what we have is just possible consideration on the agenda, possible consideration of official ANC1C comments. Um, so uh, a motion along the lines of approving and authorizing the chair to forward as ANC1C comments to the review process um, and then just bullet point the particular issues of concern. Uh, the only one that I was hearing discussed was the um, expansion of um, the width of the bike lane north of uh, Florida, but perhaps I missed another point that was being made. Um, increasing the width of the bike lane and then narrowing the travel lane. But, right, but that's, uh, that's the only one, correct? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, thank you for eloquently stating that motion. Uh, all those in favor? You need a second. Oh yes, it didn't come out of committee, so I second. Um, all those in favor of the motion, as so eloquently described by Commissioner Guthrie, uh, please indicate so by saying aye. Aye. Uh, any against? Any abstentions? All right. Thank, uh, thank you, Zach, um, for pushing this and. Um, I'll get that letter out, probably exchange a couple words with you offline. Um, okay, so we have a couple of other items on uh, the PZT agenda. Um, one is a, um, each item has, did not come with notice and was recently put on the agenda. Uh, the first of which uh, concerns a public space application at 2018th Street requesting an exception um, to DCMR, uh, that's DC Municipal Regulations regarding um, fencing. Um, ANC 1C, you know, I tried to uh, get an extension for our comments um, only because uh, we didn't have any plans. And when I uh, inquired as to what the plans were, um, I could see that there, we didn't have any plans because there weren't any plans provided. Um, so this, <laughs> this exception to the regulation was requested without any 
specific plans, layouts, drawings, or pictures actually provided. So the community actually has no idea um, what is being requested other than an exception to DCMR. So, uh, and the exception is uh, on the height of this fence that is on a residential street. It's on Vernon Street. Uh, we don't know if that's gonna be, um, the, the code says 42 inches. So this could be you know, an eight foot tall fence or it could be a 44 inch fence. But I think it's appropriate for us to um, authorize the chair to write a letter against the public space application um, and objecting on the grounds that the public space application fails to provide any layout or specs for the proposed uh, barrier. So, um, comments from commissioners. How about we put a preliminary motion to add this to the agenda because the decision will be made prior to our next meeting and therefore it will be contrary to the community's interest to fail to add this to the agenda at this point. Um, definitely. I second that preliminary motion. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Guthrie. All those in favor of adding this item to the agenda, please indicate so by saying aye. 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 Any against, any abstentions? All right, we're on the agenda. So um, as uh, I had uh, um, indicated, it's at 2018 Street. I saw that there was, um, there's a chat question, is it Lucky Bones? Yes, it is. Um, so, uh, other comments? Yeah, I, I support your motion to um, send a letter uh, objecting. It seems to me that this is very bad process on the part of public space and that this is a particular entity that has continued issues with their public space applications lacking specificity so that they can be appropriately determined by the neighborhood. So I'm happy to support this. Thank you, Commissioner Guthrie. Yes, there was a, um, you know, I'll be very brief that there was an ABC board order um, and you know, folks can find that online and it does, uh, the board order does say that uh, the establishment does contribute to rats and vermin in our neighborhood among other issues. Um, so, um, you know, to wave this through without any plans whatsoever uh, doesn't seem like the prudent thing. So uh, hearing no other comments, I'll call to a vote. All those in favor of um, uh, the resolution authorizing the chair to write a letter as I have described, please indicate so by saying aye. 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 Any against, uh, any abstentions? All right. And one more item for PZT tonight. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to move um, it. It is to, a... I'd like, I'd like to add to the agenda, the um, public space application by uh, Takaria Alato to have uh, 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 Sidewalk Cafe in their newly proposed um, restaurant facility um, on the basis that the determination will be made prior to our next meeting and it's in the interest of the neighborhood to be able to comment on that application. I second. So let's uh, um, call to a vote to add this to the agenda. Uh, all those in favor of um, the motion to add this to the agenda, please indicate so by saying aye. 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 Uh, any against, any abstentions? All right, there we go, we're on. I'd, I'd like to move that we send, that the chair send a letter to public space, um, objecting to the proposal um, as diagrammed in the application by Takaria Alato, um, based on the uh, substantial number of pedestrians who uh, traverse that particular block, the lack of other sidewalk cafes, the existence of the tree box immediately adjacent to it, 
and the problems with the adjacent property having um, inconsistent and, and somewhat dangerous to walk upon bricks that are um, not properly level, um, all of which contribute to potential danger and inconvenience for pedestrians. Um, and I'd also note that the um, proprietors for the proposed establishment had indicated that the application itself was uh, the plan that was submitted was in error and did not reflect what their actual plans were and that the ANC has no objection to that application for Sidewalk Cafe should they submit an alternative plan that shows a um, shelf that runs along the front exterior of the restaurant and seating would be either by stool or by chair at that shelf rather than having separate tabletops and, and any sort of enclosure uh, to protect the tabletops. Is it an enclosed or unenclosed? It wasn't clear to me from the application. There appears to be um, on, on the application, it looks like there's the sort of railings that you see along 18th in particular, also along Columbia Road in some places to sort of mark out your turf. Um, and in this particular location that would uh, substantially impinge on the pedestrian flow in a way that having no barrier and having chairs or stools that are facing into the restaurant would not have. Um, and the uh, neighbors that were concerned particularly about the pedestrian flow there um, seemed to feel comfortable with the idea of having the, it, it's like almost like a bar um, surface that it would be a ledge along the front of the restaurant with um, seating facing in toward the restaurant rather than having the separate tables. They seem to think that that would be a better solution to the problem of providing exterior space without impinging unduly on the pedestrian flow. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so, uh, and I'll also note that I had requested an extension for this. Uh, we had only found out about this in the last couple of days. Um, and if we don't act tonight, then we would waive all of the community's rights there. And I had uh, myself, Commissioner Guthrie, went to go seek an extension, but we have not heard back. So it forces us to act tonight. Yeah, and I'd, I'd also note that I think, did you actually second my motion? Um, I am now second. Okay. Um, the other point is that I don't think that this is a point of dispute with the applicant. I think it's a problem that came out of the, um, the drafter who was in a law office and was just doing sort of a standard draft to put in the application that would be sufficient to pass muster and get them okayed. Um, my understanding is that the applicant is going to be dropping a new plan or his lawyers on his behalf that will reflect that. But I wanna make sure that that's what actually happens. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, so comments from commissioners, uh, members of the public. Hearing none, um, all those in favor of the resolution against a request for a sidewalk cafe at 1792 Columbia Road on the basis that the proposed sidewalk cafe would impinge pedestrian flow on the sidewalk. Please indicate so by saying aye. 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 Any against, any abstentions? Okay. All right, that concludes PZT's uh, items for the night. Um, moving to uh, public services and the environment. Yeah, thank you. Um, do, can, do you mind if we switch the order around? Um, no, not at all. 
Not at okay. all. Um, I think we still have a few folks from the ranked choice boat. Um, so if we could bring that up first and um, then the restroom and then the grant. Okay, yeah. Um, so is there somebody from uh, ranked choice voting that will be speaking to this? Is that you, Commissioner Bowles, or somebody else? Yeah, I certainly can. Um, and then there's also, I'm sure if there's anyone else on the line that wants to talk about it, then just raise your hands and uh, they will promote you throughout. Um, one moment, let me pull it up and I'll screen share. Um, apologies, uh, the, the tab closed, just one moment. Mm -hmm. Okay, can folks see my screen? Yeah, we sure can. Okay, great. So this is a resolution that passed um, from the PSNE com um, committee uh, two to zero. Um, and essentially it discusses the ranked choice voting system um, in how we uh, elect uh, public officials. Uh, ranked choice voting is used in more than 15 cities um, and the state of Maine. Um, it's used by numerous organizations as well as universities to help uh, pick leaders of organizations or of a community. And for numerous good, uh, for numerous reasons, um, one, or I'm going to go over those few reasons. And uh, then if we'd like to have some of the folks speak out um, either in support or in opposition, um, and then uh, we can have comments from commissioners. Is that okay? Yeah, please. That sounds perfect. Okay. So yeah, um, I quoted a lot of scientific studies here um, just to essentially ring home the point that this is something statistically that makes voting better for people. So one of the biggest uh, parts is that it increases voter turnout. Um, there was a study uh, this past year that shows that 9.6% of, uh, there was a 9.6% increase in voter turnout in the uh, Minneapolis St. Paul area. Um, so I, we always are, I want more voter turnout. I want as many people to vote as possible. Um, and one of the reasons why people po vote to uh, point to having more voter turnout is that you have candidates um, who you can vote for and be inspired by and not feel like you have to hold your nose. And that's kind of, uh, and, and pick a candidate that will meet the threshold. Um, the next part is uh, talking about um, electability. Um, you know, this allows people who, um, again, aren't necessarily uh, having all of the money or having um, all of the uh, resources, but is allowed to um, talk about their message and um, more so create a meaningful vote um, for the candidate of their choice. Um, and that's really what we want. Um, yesterday, we had uh, 24 candidates uh, run for at-large and uh, we had two folks that won neither with a majority, which is 50% or more, but with a plurality. Um, the Democrats, Robert White, he won with 25.82%. And uh, Christina Henderson is likely to win the uh, other seat. Um, and right now, or earlier today, she had 15.07%. But what ranked choice voting would do would uh, essentially allow a majority um, of folks to uh, decide their electorates. So um, I, let's see, the next, the next study points out to more valid votes than traditional uh, votes. Um, so this is saying that uh, I guess there's less discrepancies and error prognosis um, according to race and to gender. Um, the next is 60% uh, of respondents are in favor of it. So one of the contentions is that it's confusing and that people wouldn't want to get away with it. 
Um, in a, the main um, exit poll election, uh, or in the main exit poll um, survey, they said uh, six, nearly 61% of respondents favor of keeping it or expanding ranked choice voting. So folks who are trying it now, they wanna continue to do it because they still see um, that it's, it's uh, helping. And then, uh, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, it increases the different types of folks that are running for office. Um, statistically, it increases the percentage of candidates of color running for office, um, the higher probability of females running for office, but also of them winning office. Um, so I think that you know we need more of those voices, and uh, this is a great way to get us there to build coalitions. Um, and if we want to have a few folks speak about it, um, I think we have them on the line. And I did play a video at the PSNE uh, meeting. If it's a short two minute video, um, would anyone like me to play that to better discuss what ranked choice voting is and how ranked choice voting works? Um, I think I'd benefit from that. So. Uh, please do. Yeah. Yeah. If we could have someone else talk about it really short while I find that video. I dropped the link in the chat. Oh, awesome. Yeah. Thank you. Um, uh, Sam and Bree from Rank the Vote DC are also on the line. Hey, uh, we can speak to. Um, yeah. Yeah. Please do. Okay. Awesome. So uh, we're the kind of lead organizers for Rank the Vote DC. And um, what makes ranked choice voting cool, I mean, is that our democracy is extremely fragile right now. And we need to focus on strengthening our democracy and our democratic processes. And one of the ways to do that, there's so many you know, things that need to happen from campaign finance and all these other types of transformations. Um, so ranked choice voting isn't a, a perfect answer, but what it is is a step in the right direction saying that we shouldn't, we should have um, our full preferences and um, expression of our voices be heard through our votes. And we're challenging this whole toxic two party doom loop winner takes all uh, status quo that's really serving no one right now. And we are saying that with ranked choice voting, we can have an actual democratic process, kind of what Japer said, where people actually win a majority of the votes. Yeah, and the last thing I would say is is it frees people to vote the way that they really want. There's so much strategy right now where you have to be worried about electability or the lesser of evils or splitting the vote. And really that 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 harms democracy, it harms voters, and it harms candidates and it makes them run these really perverse races. So this is a way to build a system that uh, improves all of those aspects of it. Um, and I can we can also we'd be happy to answer any uh, sort of technical questions after we watch the uh, video, if you guys want. Yeah, um, is everyone able to see? Thanks so much, folks, for talking um, a little bit more about it. Is everyone able to see my screen? Okay, cool. I'm going to yeah. close this for folks. Can we hear it? We cannot. Volume is off. Your phone. Uh, We can't really hear anything that's going on. You, you may want to restart and increase the volume there. Uh, we can't, I can't hear it at least. Uh, yeah. I think you might need to share your audio for the video. We also can just explain it quickly if, if, you, if you'd like, uh, up to you. All. I think that's, uh, that's a good um, idea. Why don't, why don't you explain it quickly? Sure, the basic idea is in, uh, voters have the option to rank their preferences, right? So you can still just vote for one if, if that's all you want to do, but you have the option to put your second choice, your third choice, et cetera. How the actual voting works or how the, the that's how the voting works, how the tabulation works is first you just look at the first place votes 
if someone wins more than 50% of the votes, the election is over like normal. If nobody gets to 50%, there's essentially what's called like our instant runoff, where the last place um, candidate gets eliminated and the voters who voted for that candidate, their votes now go towards their second choice. And you check again, does someone has more than 50%? If someone does, they're the winner. If not, you do another instant runoff and it keeps going until someone wins the majority of the vote. So would you rank all of, so in the case of the 20 some person race for at large, you know, would you rank everyone? How many do you do your top three? How does that work? So there's lots of different ways. Um, we're still figuring out exactly where we're writing the bill that we want to introduce next time. Um, but we'd probably cap it at five or maybe 10. Um, I think it, it depends. There's lots of different ways to set it up, but just to make it less confusing, you don't want people to, feel like they have to rank forever and have all these different, you know, bubbles filled in. Uh, but generally you, you can rank, you know, if you wanted to, you could rank all of them, but you don't have to rank as, you know, you have no re requirement to rank um, a, a certain amount. It's completely up to the voter. What happens if I don't rank any? What if I just leave one? That's totally fine. Uh, your and vote's it's, like it's normal. It's just like status yeah. quo, the way we vote right now. Except that it wouldn't be reallocated. Well, right. So if, if you're not saying what your what your next choice is, you're essentially saying if there was a runoff, I wouldn't vote. So if I chose uh, in the case of, so if there were 20 and then if I didn't, if I picked 15, then in a runoff, my, it would be the same as not voting. Sorry, I think I explained it poorly there. Um, generally, you don't rank that many unless you really have an opinion about all of them. Um, and you'd probably want it to, for simplicity to have to make a system have less than that uh, total rankings. But you rank however many you 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 have an opinion about it and you would want to vote for essentially you say okay they're my lowest choice or they're my second favorite they're my third favorite and then your vote gets reallocated only if your first place vote gets eliminated in one of the runoffs so an example uh sorry don't don't mute just yet so yeah. an example i think uh to answer his question would be say let's take our um at large race again and say that you would you have a preference of five candidates, well, then you would rank those five candidates, but then that's where you would prefer to stop and that's okay. But say you feel really strongly about one of the more unpopular candidates and you just vote for them in an instant runoff, your vote wouldn't be reallocated because you voted for a very unpopular candidate. Just like status quo, the way we vote right now, if you were to vote for an unpopular candidate, your vote still wouldn't really yeah. Be counted. Essentially, all it I does. I mean, it is counted, but it's the, yeah. it isn't to decide the winner. It's not a popular candidate. The only change here is that if your candidate isn't one of the top candidates, you're still allowed to put them first without feeling like you're wasting your vote because your vote will go to one of the more quote unquote electable or more popular or whatever candidates if you have them as your second or third or whatever choice. Yeah, and what we see about, I guess, the at-large race too is that people have really weird preferences and things yeah. like that. And there's no good way to understand how voters uh, would go right now in a, if we did have ranked choice voting system because we don't understand voters' preferences uh, so beyond the, their, the, like, elect, uh, their strategic vote. Yeah. In the case of uh, our at-large race, um, this would we would have uh, gone through uh, different cycles until a candidate reaches uh, fifty percent. Until two, in our case, reach fifty percent. So with multi winner, it's a it's a little bit different, where the win percentage goes down to thirty three percent because okay. because there's two okay. voters. Um, but it's essentially a majority in however many multi winner you want. Uh, and yeah, you would keep doing. Um, you would keep reallocating people's votes until we got a kind of uh, two candidates who achieved yeah, majority. A, a majority within a two 
a pick two election. And what makes this really cool is that voters are able to um, kind of break this whole electable speculation and actually vote their preference and their values and then maybe save their second or third vote for strategy or party or whatever. And we're seeing some comments, and I think this is a really another good fact for it. Right now, the only strategy to win an election is to um, sort of put down all of your opponents uh, and say you're the only one. But um, ranked choice voting changes the incentives so you can start to be like, well, actually, we agree on a lot of things. So if you like them, you should put me second. Um, so it really changes the culture of how elections can be run. Also, apologies. I it's been a long day, so I yeah. feel like we're a little dry right now. Yeah. But, um, <laughs> I think that's the, also a really crucial part is that it changes the culture of elections, where uh, candidates really have to put in the work to build a broad, you know, coalition and not tear other candidates down in the way politics is done right now, which this makes everyone so um, disillusioned and feel shut out from the political processes. It it says candidates can form a coalition together and say, hey, if I'm not your first choice, then rank me second, because I think this other person is really great. Um, and I, I saw the energy from Ed Lazier and Christina Henderson this past race, also two candidates who supported ranked choice voting, because Ed Lazier from the very beginning was like, Christina Henderson is also awesome. And I think just that kind of um, healthy politics is something that is desperately needed in our democracy. And I feel like DC could be leading in that. And that would be incredible uh, if that happens, especially if you were to get statehood, which is a whole different conversation. Hmm. Hmm. And, um, I would encourage folks to definitely watch the videos. It's very easy. I mean, they, there's so many different ways um, to better understand it and watch it, um, but there it's relatively easy, relatively short. Um, and our resolution asks that we uh, that the DC Council members reintroduce the Ranked Choice Voting Act. Uh, I presume it'd be of 2021 um, to hold public hearings on it and to pass it into law implementation for the 2022 primary and general elections. It also requests that Mayor Bowser sign the bill um, and then work with the DC Board of Elections to inform the general public on this uh, voting change because it does take voter education, um, but uh, you know that I we believe it's it's worth it um, to have a better and more uh, workable democracy. Well, um, you know, thank you, thank you all for. Uh, um, answering my my questions, uh, I you know, this is a learning experience for me. Learning about this and it sounds um, like there's a lot of good benefits there, um, um, and it does also sound like uh, it may take some uh, more education, uh, you know, more information um, here. Um, I'm, you know, generally in favor of everything I've heard. Um, I don't know if I want to go as far as to say pass it into law uh, for implementation in the 2022 primary. Um, it's not that, uh, it's just I'm not, I don't feel that I'm informed enough to make that choice myself currently. Um, but, you know, that's, uh, um, I, and, to that effect, uh, I'd, I'd be happy to vote for the resolution if we the pass it into law for implementation part. Yeah, I think that uh, we, we are the first of many ANCs that will be considering these types of resolutions. Um, so the implementation uh, for the 2022, I would admit, is relatively soon and quick. However, I would say that DC Board of Elections has done a pretty good job, at least of the general election management um, in the short amount of time. So I believe that they would be able to implement it in that time, uh, short of time period. Um, and also this is something, uh, this date is what the advocates have been asking for. 
So I am also a minimal to it. I think that, you know, it's better for the movement for us to pass this than say pass this or not pass this because we put it on a short time frame. So that's where I stand. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I'd like to, uh, I think we should be reintroducing it. We should be holding public hearings. We should be talking more about it um, and informing the public. Uh, there should be just more um, about this. Uh, so I don't want to monopolize uh, commissioners, uh, other commissioners, questions, comments. Uh, so Commissioner did, Gregory, yeah. did, was that friendly accepted? It was, yes. Uh, yeah, I, I think this is certainly something that's worth looking at, trying, you know, trying for an election to see if, if it helps with some of the problems that we've had in the district and with local elections. Um, and perfectly willing to support it. And let's do this and move on to the next item. Yeah, okay. Um, just a point of... Uh... Clarification, uh, when you say be it further resolved, sign the past ranked choice voting act, is that like a forward looking statement? Yeah. Um, yeah. So if we're removing the next part, we probably don't need, uh, if we're not putting a timeline on it, we probably could just say, and that mayor about to consider, yeah. Yeah, yeah, uh, and work with the, the second part of the sentence works, you know, work with the DC Board of Elections to inform the general public on this voting option, perhaps, you know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, you know, I, everything that I've heard, um, I, I would hope that uh, this becomes a bigger issue and gains more visibility and you know, building coalitions uh, is important and giving people, you know, uh, getting their voice heard, everything that was said just sounds really good. But, you know, it's one of those things where um, it's hard to make a decision over five minutes of, or 10 minutes, you know, I think we all need to learn more about it, so. Um, I also really support ranked choice voting, um, especially when we have so many candidates in DC for the council. It would have been really, really helpful this past election cycle. So um, I, I don't think that two years from now is like too much to ask. I think it's really important. So I would also support the timeline. Um, I think it would be great to see it passed. Um, so yeah, I support this wholeheartedly. Okay. So I guess since there is um, support, maybe we could do a quick vote on a timeline and then uh, one without a timeline, if need be. I would suggest this is not something that is exclusive to ANC1C. I don't see us getting great weight from anyone about this. I think this is an expression of support and concern and interest in the process. And I think we can do it however the language is and I, I really don't think we should be taking a whole lot of time trying to parse out the language. I mean, maybe the timeline could just not include pass into law and it could have requests that the council members reintroduce the act and hold hearings. I think that's exactly what was accepted as a friendly. That was, okay. I, I didn't know if it actually was accepted or not. Sorry. Yeah, sure. Um, okay. okay. So, all right. Yeah. Uh, so you'll make those, you'll make that change uh, that we had discussed in the first and second be it resolved. And then, is that right? All right, so then why don't we go to vote? Um, any other discussion, members of the public? I thought I saw a hand raised, um, but I guess not. Um, commissioners, all right, hearing none. Um, this came out of committee, so no second needed. Um, all those in favor of the um, resolution with the friendlies, uh, as was discussed, please indicate so by saying aye. 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 Uh, any against? Any abstentions? All right. So uh, moving along to the uh, second item. Uh, of PSC, the public restrooms.
Okay, so um, the Department of General Services, um, in consultation with other uh, district agencies, is asking for bids, I believe, as well as ANCs and other community members um, for uh, locations for the implementation of the Public Restroom Act that uh, Council Member Brianna Doe helps um, sheep her through council and find funding for. Um, so this is in response to that. And essentially it is a really simple application. And <clears throat> I, uh, I wanted us to simply just write a letter um, that, oh, actually I have it pulled up and I can share it. So essentially I mimicked our letter as to what the form would be. Exactly. Um, and um, so Crinch, Kristen, says that there's a survey that was sent around requesting the locations. So uh, this is the survey, essentially just the answers to the survey. Um, and it would be filled in, with uh, our answers and given our great weight to it. So um, I could go over our specific answers and then talk about the specific locations. Um, I think that makes sense. Uh, others? Okay, so um, the first question um, is, do we have a need for a standalone public restroom? I think that ANC1C has well said that there's a need for that in the district. So yes on that. Um, in terms of, and this was determined from the PS&E committee, um, in terms of how frequently we, we witness public def defecation or urination in the neighborhood. Um, I would say at least in my single member district, I see at least daily or at least once a week. Um, of course, folks, please chime in if they think that that's different. Um, how frequently do we see discarded feces or urination? So to me, that um, that's like a, I'm thinking a diaper or urine in a water bottle. Um, I'd probably say that's once a week. That's not an everyday occurrence for me, but I, of course I'm willing to listen to other folks on the line here. Um, the next was uh, what recommendations uh, for uh, the location for the standalone, standalone restrooms. Um, so I know that the bid uh, put Unity Park as their top answer. And I think that since Kristen mentioned in her, uh, in the response in the chat, there's only funding for two of these, um, that it would be sense to also put Unity Park as our number one um, request. There are two, um, I mean, the budget fluctuates and uh, every few, uh, there's another supplemental coming through. So we don't, who knows where the money will come from um, ultimately, but I think it makes sense for us to um, identify the biggest need. Um, so I think Unity Park makes sense um, and I'm happy to reorder these other interests, but as Kristen and others have indicated, we'll be lucky to get one in Ward 1, um, much less uh, Adams Morgan. And um, I think it makes most sense to pick the one that the bid and other residents of the neighborhood have uh, identified as where we should put a public restroom. Any questions? Um, so is that uh, the recommendations, is that in order is that ranked choice there <laughs> um i don't believe it is it, it was just simply list so just. i'm happy to um add and or rank more ted yeah um what's the dhs installed quarter jar yeah and actually Kristen, are you on the line I think you'd be able to describe that better. It's, um, yeah. do you know the alley behind, or, or Kristen, I guess you probably can describe that. Yeah, sure. So it's um, DHS installed a um, temporary portage on, on Adams Mill Road, um, right near the bus shelter, um, close to Koji Bell Bakery. Like right next to the alley uh, that's parallel to linear. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah. Yeah. And that's there. I believe there was a, a portage on there previously. Correct, Kristen? Yeah, there was. It was um, for um, Pepco construction work, um, and um, uh, DHS installed this 
last week, I think, um, after many months of going back and forth trying to find a good location for it. Um, so um, yeah, this is free from DHS and they are supposed to clean it five times a week. Um, we're keeping an eye on it to make sure that it doesn't get completely filthy and that gets hand sanitizer replaced inside and toilet paper, et cetera. So, um, and our team has been showing people that it's there. So there's a couple people that are defecating and urinating in public on a pretty much daily basis. And so they're trying to encourage them towards this Porta John. Well, I, I guess my general comment on this is my understanding was that there was supposed to be a Walter Pierce Park um, facility put in that was a, a, I think they called them a Portland version of it, that was supposed to go into the park during the rehabilitation process. And I've never heard any reason as to why it wasn't, except that suddenly we wound up with COVID sort of at the end of the process and they just don't seem to be doing anything about it. Um, but if we've got the portable portageon that is there on adjacent to BB&T Plaza, it seems that that might well take care of any need in Unity Park, which is so small that uh, other than uh, portageon, I, I would hate to take up space that would be required for something like that. Um, in addition, my understanding is that this is directed towards the um, Public Facilities Act that was going to have a couple of model uh, placements that then there would be further funding and further determination. And it seems to me that Adams Morgan should not at all be pushing itself to the front of the line on this. We have numerous commercial establishments that provide the opportunity for at least a large number of the people. I'm glad to hear that we've got the one on uh, uh, BB&T Plaza for people who might not otherwise have access to it, but I don't think that we should be pushing ourselves ahead of the line when there are many other neighborhoods that don't have nearly the um, at least somewhat public uh, accessible facilities. And uh, when there's a very limited number, I, I don't feel comfortable supporting this as a proposal. I, I think there's many other areas in the, in the DC that this should be going in instead of here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are only two that are going to be done under the thing citywide, and why in the hell are we taking um, even one of those two? I think and um, I definitely hear, I definitely hear that. Um, I just, um, you know, I, we need more money and funding for it. I mean, that's all the like. So, but, but at this point in time, what they're asking for is community input on where to locate these two that are funded and that are going to be part of the model study. And it really seems to me, especially if we've got, if Walter Pierce Park was supposed to be separately funded that had nothing to do with that through the, the park rehabilitation, and we've got the um, porta potty that is at bb and I, I just feel really greedy asking for anything more at this point in time. So, I mean, please, anyone, my thought process is that DHS would likely remove the porta john once COVID is over with. And um, this, this type of uh, restroom facility uh, would take its place. We wouldn't have both of them, but we would have one of them. Um, yeah, I mean, I think I think maybe, I mean, we just need more funding for money for more. I mean, we're our neighborhood advisory commissioners, so we're advocating for our neighborhoods. I totally feel you. There are definitely needed places. I will also say that having these continued conversations. Um, with uh, you know, trying to address the public urination, DPR, DGS, and other agencies have said that Adams Morgan would be a public uh, would be a good place because there are so many intersections and so many different populations that would be able to use it. Um, not just the bar scene, but the folks that um, are in transit um, and people that are working. Um, and it is a tourist destination, but we still do have a lot of neighborhood activity 
Um, so yeah, I think we would, we, we are, uh, I mean, we are a qualified neighborhood for it. Um, well, I, so, would, yeah. I, would, I would be much more comfortable if, you know, the list of proposals um, was prefaced by something that suggested that we recognize that the rest of, that other neighborhoods in the district have a substantial need for these initial uh, models and that we would um, not be inclined to request, but if there is in fact money for extra ones beyond the additional, the first two, that these are areas that we should consider. Um, in addition, wouldn't it be great if we had uh, one at the SunTrust Plaza for the people who make use of the plaza? Should the easement be acknowledged? Okay, so do we, is there an amendment or is there anything? Cause I mean, it is just an online survey. So my thought process was that Amir or I or someone fill out the online survey with these answers and then follow up with DGS with a formal letter. Um, I think in the formal letter, yeah, we could definitely make state exactly i mean i absolutely want us all to say there needs to be more funding for this for everywhere across the city um that's something like i'm interested um in working on well i'd have no objection if this is simply a, a response that's going in as a survey and that we make clear in the accompanying letter that is sent that we're not trying to elbow our way to the front for those two very precious model ones that are going to go somewhere in the district. And maybe we can add. We have already, on. we supported as an ANC, we supported that resolution back before it, that uh, um, program, before it was even implemented. I think we were the first ANC to do that. Yeah. yeah. I strongly support it, but it, there is a need that is so much greater in other neighborhoods than there is here that I don't want to push some neighborhood out of the way that really needs it. Um, and I think someone that's, rel uh, I think there's, there's a comment that's really relevant to that is, uh, you know, the more requests that we have and more requests from neighborhoods and associations, the more that council will likely, and the mayor, honestly, will likely see that there needs to be more funding for this. So I think, I mean, that's definitely an, an argument for it as well. Thank you. Thank you, Johan. Yona, sorry. Okay, okay. Um, so it looks like uh, what we would do is um, submit these into the survey um, and then uh, we could have a letter written um, requesting uh, more uh, in the city and also that uh, we are not, uh, that we recognize that there are only two being funded currently. Uh, we think that there should be more in the city that are funded and that our requests are not um, uh, meant to uh, elbow out other areas in uh, more dire need. I'll work on that language, yeah. Yeah, I like that and I, it Is definitely adds, yeah. it adds depth and like uh, to the issue that we're trying to address. Not just saying, hey, I know you're, you just want soliciting impact, but we really need to fix this in a holistic not have us fighting against each other for, for scraps here. Okay, okay. And that's, uh, um, given that there's a funding element, um, we probably wanna send that uh, to somebody other than DGS, maybe DC council. Is there a specific council member um, you have in mind? Um, yeah, we can just send it to Phil. I think that makes the most sense. Phil, I mean, we could send it to all of them, but Phil definitely, or I'm sorry, Chairman Mendelson. Yeah. Well, I think it, it should also definitely go to um, Council Member Nadeau since she was instrumental in getting the bill passed, just to let her yep. know. <laughs> okay. Um, let me just note. Um, all right. So uh, this came out of committee, right? Yeah. Okay. So uh, came out of committee, um, so no second needed. Uh, questions from members of the public? Um, 
Okay, hearing none, calling to a vote. Uh, all those in favor of uh, the letter and survey responses uh, as discussed, please indicate so by saying aye. 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 Any against? Any abstentions? All right. Six zero. And the last uh, item on our agenda for tonight, um, the Jubilee Jumpstart Grant. Um, I understand that this had, uh, there was a lot of back and forth with uh, Gottlieb, the director of the office of ANC to get this pre-screened, pre-approved uh, for reimbursement. And how that works is our, um, when we uh, grant funds, uh, so long as they meet the criteria uh, that is set out in the statute, um, then we are reimbursed for that. If uh, it does not meet that criteria, then we lose that money in our next district allotment. Uh, so thanks for going through. Uh, it's always a, um, a helpful thing to get these things pre-screened. So thanks for going through that. Uh, Commissioner Bowles, take it away. Yeah, so um, this has kind of two, three-ish caveats here. Um, okay, so essentially Jubilee Jumpstart, uh, they um, work with students and they are working to have uh, students uh, come in and do um, in-class learning. And the only way that they can do in-class learning is by having um, COVID safe measures, which in, uh, includes um, essentially subdividing a room. And um, they're hoping to seek um, funds to help pay for that. Um, Right now they have over $40,000 in COVID related expenses and uh, are really seeking you know, any opportunity for help. Um, Jubilee Jumpstart, uh, let's see, I don't know if they have a spot on who they are here, but they're definitely familiar with our granting process as well as in our neighborhood. Um, the specific request would be for 16 children um, for a class of eight, um, at two groups of class of eight. And um, that would be um, for the winter semester as well as the spring semester and the summer semester. So um, 16 times three uh, is students that would be um, essentially allowed to um, use these uh, COVID safe furniture pieces. Um, and the reason why, you know, we're trying to say how many people is because one of the things that we try to do with grants is say, uh, you know, how much bang we get for our buck here um, and how many people um, that we would be uh, helping. So um, they're predicting that the uh, health emergency would be lasting until at least the summer semester. Um, so they would get quite a few folks rotating um, through that. Um, the next part of that is that there is, uh, in our, uh, ANC bylaws, um, it would require, um, a suspension of our bylaws to spend money within the first three months of a term or the last three months of a term. And according to, um, Robert's rules of order, that would require a two thirds vote from the commission. Um, so moving forward, if we would like to do this, a two thirds vote of this commission of eight um, would require five votes. So essentially all of us on the line here um, to move this forward to allow for us to spend money within the last three months of um, our term for granting purposes. And then um, in terms of vetting this, uh, they did apply within our, before our three months term. Um, we have just been doing a grant pretty much every single time. And there was a lot of other grants that we considered. Um, so due to the ANC schedule and um, their need of 
the product, they actually already purchased this. Um, so one of the reasons why we also we were going back and forth with the office of ANC is that typically reimbursable um, expenditures are not something in terms of grants are something that the office of ANC uh, deems as uh, reimbursable. Uh, however, they said um, we have the we have the okay um, for the amount of people that this affects. Um, that is cleared and up to our discretion, as well as um, it being cleared as a essentially a reimbursement payment if we do move forward with this. So um, the what allows us to do this is the emergency, uh, the COVID emergency um, legislation that council members passed earlier in the uh, health pandemic. And um, we have definitely had some interesting appli um, applicants for our grants. It seems like every month or so, um, you know, we are constantly pushing the, uh, the margins on what this emergency legislation is permitted to do. And um, this uh, actually was vetted through the Office of Attorney Generals to see if it would um, fit under the mandate. And uh, they agreed that it did. And um, that's where we're at. So we have to do our own procedural hurdle um, to spend this. And if it doesn't go through that, I will need to discuss with the uh, applicants on how we'll move forward um, in the, uh, well, six months from now, or um, if there's an option for the next commission to try to spend money previous, uh, in that three month window, um, which I don't see highly possible and or plausible considering it takes quite some time to uh, get grants running on things. Um, so yeah, I'm totally open to questions, um, comments. Um, I, they filed the application for the grant. They went through the process. I went through all the processes. Um, I too had concerns with how many people that it would be affecting, um, as well as the reimbursement process, as well as the rules. Um, but, uh, you know, we have clearance from folks and workarounds for others. So, um, you know, we're up to the commission to make these determinations. And uh, I'm just glad that we're able to give money to community members, even if not all of the people who ask for it necessarily get it. So. Um, any questions from Michigan? Um, so uh, you mentioned that there's an issue in our bylaws, but where does it say that in our bylaws? So pardon me, it's not our bylaws, it's our grant uh, procedure. And that um, is what we have been using to guide all of our, um, all of our grant guidance. And it mentions it, um, I can pull up one. Okay, yeah, yeah. No, that's, uh, that's um, to me, that, that makes all the difference, right? Because um, to over, I don't think we can use a parliamentary, I, you know, all these technical things I never knew about before. I don't think we can use a parliamentary procedure to uh, overrule our own bylaws, but if it's not in our bylaws, then, you know, that's a moot point. So, um, that was my uh, only question. Questions from other commissioners? Uh, Commissioner Guthrie? Yeah, I, I, first of all, Japer, thank you for all of the work on this. This obviously was uh, um, tremendously time consuming and challenging and I, I really appreciate, especially the back and forth with, um, uh, with Gottlieb on this. Um, I, I do have a couple of questions, one that my understanding for the limitation on expenditures for grants was that it was part of the ANC um, <clears throat> enactments, uh, you know, as a district-wide enactment that we weren't supposed to, and supposedly it has something to do with not being able to, you know, reward or disfavor to try and get votes for an election, something like that. Um, but if Gottlieb didn't suggest that this was a problem uh, given his um, continued involvement in this right now. 
I, I guess that must not be a problem. Uh, my other concern was that you had said at the start of the meeting, Japer, that we'd gotten some allocations that weren't reflected in that accounting because they'd come in after the accounting period. And I was just wondering, um, this is, is like half of the amount that's shown on the balance for the last um, ANC accounting. And I, I would be more comfortable in providing them with like a chunk of what they've requested, like 2000 instead of 4000 given all of the grants that we've been seeing and all of the need that we see during this time to provide them with at least some of the some of what they need to do what they're doing um, and, and still have money left in the bank that we can apply for other people. Yeah, and um, so for the first part, I am I'm interested in passing um, it with a conditionality that it is reviewed again for the three month start and back end because I, as treasurer, I want to get this reimbursed <laughs> for sure. And um, I am still I'm having difficulties logging into the bank account right, of course, right when I'm on the ANC meeting. But I did check it this morning and it is $29,000 in the bank account. So we do have quite a bit of change in there. But um, again, I think, <clears throat> um, I mean, yeah, spending money is, is a lot. If we were to do a partial limit, um, <coughs> I don't know. I mean, I'm sure they would take any money over no money. So that can well, definitely. Especially considering that they've already expended at least a chunk of the money. Um, it, it seems like, particularly where there's, you know, a, a fairly limited pool of um, beneficiaries of this money. Um, and historically, we had not been giving out grants bigger than $2,000 in the past. Um, and we have regularly supplied a Jubilee Jumpstart with an annual appropriation for whatever it is they request. It really seems to me to make more sense to apply it as $2,000 for them to use in a way that's with it, consistent and within the uh, grant request, and to you know hold back the other two thousand so that we can use it for some other needy purpose in the neighborhood because I'm sure we will have them. So um, I I can definitely uh, get behind that type of motion as well. Um, I would like to move it as I'm concerned if. I'm, I don't know, I haven't ever moved on a grant in partial payment before. So my question, I would wanna, do you know if we're, I know it sounds silly, but are we allowed to, I mean, we, I would, I don't know if we're allowed to do partial payment or not. No, 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 but I, I, I think what we are allowed to do is to, um, authorize a grant in the amount of 2000 when they have requested 4000 okay. um, and and to authorize a grant to jubilee jumpstart in the amount of 2000 to be applied um, to um, that portion of the grant application that they choose um, you know so long as it's all within the covid relief and um, that the reason that this grant be um, contingent upon further confirmation from the office of the ANC that we are not in violation of um, uh, any sort of um, prohibition from making grants within six months before or after the election. So I think my uh, the only ish, the only thing that comes to mind right now would be the issue is that uh, I need receipts that and all the receipts that I have match a check. So I don't know if they would be able to, I, I would just want to, I'm happy to move with that motion, but I would need to get clarification, as you said, from uh, Gottlieb that we would be sending a check that doesn't have a receipt from their provider or whatnot. Um, Cause that's what essentially I've been getting from our grantees. Does that make sense? Well, it seems, it seems to me that what you could do is, because normally what they do is 
we provide them with the check, they provide us with the receipt because generally they haven't expended the money yet. So the fact that they've expended more than the amount that we're granting them means that they can allocate a certain amount of that to the receipts. They should be able to provide us with receipts for that portion of the items that are purchased on a prorated basis without yeah. a problem, I would think. We've yeah. certainly done that with Adams Morgan Day, when okay, we had okay, okay. with um, you know how much a particular porta potty was going to cost and allocating <laughs> okay. amounts. Um, so that's that is a book work issue that we need to get back okay. from the grant application uh, applicants, but it's something that sh they should be able to facilitate with us. But I, I am concerned about that six months. Um, I guess we could. <coughs> and it's have, actually we could have a preliminary motion to allow um, this particular grant application, even if it is with, not within the normal grant guidelines of ANC1C, uh, because it was actually applied for before the deadline and we were not able to facilitate it during that time period, and we are now, and we believe that this is an important thing to do, and blah, blah, blah. Yeah, if we can turn all of that into a motion, I'm down to second it. So essentially conditionality on um, us being able to provide the funds within the three months time period um, of the ending of a term and then also the conditionality that it would be a partial grants and of $2,000. I think I heard a motion. So uh, call to a vote. Um, all those in favor of the motion, uh, please indicate so by saying aye. 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 Any against? Any abstentions? There we go. Awesome. Thanks for that. Thanks for everyone's uh, thoughtful consideration and uh, troubleshooting in that. But that was the motion to uh, go, like that covered our guidelines, right? Right, right. We, to we, also, we also need a motion to fund the grant for $2,000 uh, subject to um, reconfirmation by Office of the ANC that this grant uh, is consistent with the any limitations on the time frame. Yeah. So just subject to uh, conditions. I don't think that there is a limitation on the time frame. Um, well, I know, I remember hearing it in the past, so yeah. I thought it was a statutory one, but I, I can't imagine that Gottlieb wouldn't have mentioned it if that's the case. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think it's us, and we covered it with the motion, but happy with the condition, conditional language. So um, all those in favor, uh, Jaber, you took that down, is that right? Okay, And, cool. and we need a second, right? Um, so- Well, actually it came out of the committee, so this is, sort of a second on the modification of it, of what came out of the committee, I guess? I think it's accepted as a friendly, so no second okay. needed. Okay. Um, all right, um, no other discussion. All those in favor of the motion as uh, indicated, uh, or as discussed, please indicate so by saying aye. 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 Uh, any against and any abstentions? So, it was a night of unanimous votes. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we can show America how it's done. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Good job. Good work. Thanks. <laughs>